So here I have 40 Lightning Coils, 40 Chronicles of Atzoatl, and a few other items mixed in based on what the Chronicle contains. My logic is if I have an Apex of Ascension, I'm going to be upgrading an item. I just picked a random assortment of things that had a decent profit margin. If there's a Doriani's Institute, I'm going to have fun gambling and enlighten. Uh, I'm going to just admit, unlike the items where I made sure there's a profit margin, I didn't really do the math on the Enlightens. It's just kind of fun to gamble them. So um, that's going to be a kind of fun to gamble thing. And then for the Lightning Coils, they are all six socketed item level 20 Lightning Coils, which means there was a decent investment into each, but that investment should be recouped and then some every time it goes white. It's going to be some fun results, though, when it doesn't go white. And now the goal is to uh, start slamming these. Yeah, I'm going to just take all these scarabs out. These can go over here for now. Yeah, you guys live here now. Cool. We're going to have fun. There's a couple of things to note. If there's a tier three room, I will probably do it. I'm probably going to kill the Omnitech just because it's a good way to see how profitable this actually is. And I'm not going to worry about killing everything. And Krendor, welcome back with the 10 month badge. Yes, you can grind for your 10 month badge and have a nice shiny map. It just takes a little bit of time. Welcome back and hey, you're almost at the one year mark. Congratulations. Yes, welcome fellow gamblers. Okay. Speaking of gambles, got ID stuff. So, Sanctum of Immortality, then up to the Locus of Corruption, Conduit of Lightning. I've been good. Pretty busy, but good. Things have been going well. Do I get a good old Guadalitzi chest? No, oh, I don't know why those aren't on my filter. But I'm going to pick them all up. Something tells me my filter may be slightly too strict for this. All right, just Shrine of Empowerment. Going to go through here. In theory, if you have good buffs, you can kill all the monsters in here. Uh, this one does not have good buffs, so I'm not going to do that. Oh, yeah, food poisoning sucks. Conduit of Lightning. Actually, does Conduit of Lightning have one of the boxes? I don't think it does. Right? Let's find out. Oh, it does. Thunder Coffer. Oh. Got the item. Cool. Non-channeling minus six. I should lower the strictness of my filter so that I can actually see all this stuff. Still not showing up. Uh, wait. Oh, there we go. Cool. Now I can actually see all this stuff. Because if there's a good base here, I'm definitely going to want to pick it up. Oh, percent mana amulet. Yeah, I don't think any of those are good. Oh, Christian has a good point. You should make sure to get chaos immunity. Then you'll be fine. All right, so first Gamba. Let's go. Turned all white. All right. Didn't poof. The chest piece still exists. Always a good start when the chest piece still exists afterwards. So that is no guarantee that its value increased. Mm, sounds like you went into a minus max. All right. That's first half of Omnitech down. I'm just going to collect all the temple junk because I'm genuinely curious if any of it will actually sell. I'm going to start just putting it into a tab. Well, not all the temple junk, but most of the temple junk. That's how I should say it. I'm going to collect... Ooh. Wait, really? A vial of consequence? <laughs> okay. That's actually relatively valuable. Ooh. 
That's rough. Okay, so this is going to go here. This is going to go here. This is going to go here. Don't care about that. And these just go into my dump tab. I'm going to fill the dump tab with any of these that don't look particularly impressive. And none of these look particularly impressive. All right, next temple. I would be perfectly happy if these poofed, to be honest with you. Because I've got so many of them. A few of them are going to... Let's see, so this is only a locus of corruption, so I just rush top. I mean, I guess there's the warehouses. I'll try to remember to go through that. But it's whatever. I've got some good temples and some bad temples. I'm not going to stress about killing every monster in here. You don't even need to be a melee player to not read. Not reading is the Path of Exile classic. Oh. Oh, that's easy. You just find a crafting project that's really not working out and keeps eating your money to the point where you hate that thing and you're okay with it being gone. Wait, what dropped? out? Oh, don't care about that. There is nothing really interesting in these, so I'm just going to keep going. Oh, wait. Wrong way. All right, next up. Poof. Nope. Socketed duration, socketed trap or mine. All right. Um, this is not the norm, chat. You do not normally hit a good double gem corruption on your second attempt. But I'm kind of happy that I did, because that's neat. I do not know how much money that is. I'm going to guess it's money, though. Yes, it is a thing you can buy. You buy the Chronicle of Atsawaddle with a locus of corruption. I'm going to be honest, I don't think we profited yet. I have 80 divines in stuff. Well, that's garbage. Okay, well, there's nothing else here, right? <laughs> Wait, why is this random staff better than the temple item? When your temple item is so bad that a random staff is better. Nice. See, I bought a lot of this because I wanted to go all out and see if it's really a good idea to do this or not. And that reminds me. I should uh, let people know what I'm doing. See, Locus of Corruption, House of the Other, Throne of Atziri, Atlas of World. Do I really fight Atziri? Yeah. Well, let's let's do it. If this goes badly, I'm skipping Atziri from now on. Also, if this goes badly, even though this is my decision and my decision alone, I'm blaming chat. <laughs> Just saying. Hey. Yeah, these are quite expensive. They were around one and a half divines each, I believe. I think I paid closer to 1.3 on average. It is not reasonable to start double corrupting any old thing, no. So the problem in terms of killing Atziri is, can I kill Atziri? <laughs> I know Atziri does have value, it's a matter of, am I bad at the fight? Oh, she has no health. Never mind. Yeah, this is going to be easy. Because I'm reflect immune. 
So I can just do this and then just walk around. Okay, we're definitely killing Adziri from now on. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Uh, Snow is correct. So the normal chatters will be blamed if anything goes badly, but not the mods. Yeah, Hyrule boots are value. I'm trying to remember what else might be value at this point in the league. Probably not much. To be fair, Adziri is from a time where if you had 300,000 DPS, your build was high damage. Um, this build has millions of DPS. So she's kind of just been power crept on a little bit. Oh, the Triumvirate. You know, I wonder if that's money. The Breach, sure, mostly because it's fun. I'm going to try to open all three at once. Just because the more enemies are in the room, the better my build is at dealing with the enemies in the room because of Explody effects. Yeah. I wonder what would it look like if GGG did an Adziri Redux and completely revamped the fight and remade her for modern PoE. That would be kind of cool. Yes, those uh, sacrifice fragments are also Adziri. And that level of Adziri is roughly the difficulty that she is in here. However, there's another version called Uber Adziri, which uses the mortal fragments instead of the sacrifice fragments, which is much more difficult by Adziri standards, which is to say for this build, she would still just explode. Oh man, I do remember that, Felix. I remember Aura snapshotting. The funniest thing about that time, though, was when you had blood magic on your map. And most people played hardcore back then. So people would go into hardcore with all their auras on. Poof. There we go. That's the expected outcome. Yeah, they go into hardcore. They have all their auras on. And they're in a map that has blood magic. Guess what happens if you have all of your auras on, reserving all of your mana? Spoiler alert. You have to make a new character. Ten percent of chaos leeches instant. That would be neat. You know, a lot of her items are fine. Like um, at Ziri's boots, the step, those are great. Then you have a flask, which is more a matter of the numbers on it got nerfed. I do think adding utility like percent of chaos leech is instant would make it very very viable. Huh? What else could we do? Adziri's rain is probably fine. It it almost feels like a meme item, but a uh, deserved meme item. Wait, what was the tempest from? Oh, just tempest generator. Got it. Ultimatum aspect. Cool. Life damage leached. Yes, sure. A sacrificial heart. From hits taken as, hmm, kind of decent. Yeah. The random PKs were hilarious. So triumvirate mods, level of socketed Val gems, more damage, tailwind, huh? <coughs> I don't know if that's a good one. What I do know is we are blasting these. So, Locus of Corruption, Tier 3. Storm of Corruption, meaning I could get Corrupted Six Links. But I don't think I want to step in Corrupted Six Links for this anymore. The Vault's probably worth clicking, because it's money. 
the explosives room might be worth clearing. Yeah, no, it didn't look like a good ring. The skill effect duration is probably what kills it more than anything, to be honest. Because skill effect duration on Vol skills means, yes, they last longer, but also they go on cooldown for longer. Huh. Actually, are there hate fortune shenanigans you can do with that? I forget exactly how that works. There might be some room for hate fortune shenanigans with that. Also, did I just miss the chest and the vault or is there none here? Uh, the move speed on this build is perfectly fine for what it's intended for. It's just not made for running through this content. But if I was doing my normal content, fighting Harbingers and stuff, move speed doesn't really help you. Also, I'm going to be honest with you, when builds go significantly faster than this, they're just annoying to play. It's just there's so many people that have brain rot and think that movement speed is the only defining feature of a build, even in content where movement speed literally doesn't help you. Ooh, Trapper Mind Gems. Movement speed's fine if you want to make something to run through content quickly, but that's not what this build's made for. So it doesn't really need more move speed. It's fine. In general, I'm just tired of people talking about move speed on builds. And PoE being quote-unquote fast and all that nonsense. Hmm. Vol Firestorm. Huh. Yeah. Exactly like Snow says. Don't get me wrong, right now it's a bit on the slow side because most of my movement speed normally comes from teleporting into packs and there aren't good packs to teleport into in the temple, unlike a map. But also, like, I'm just so tired of the whole make your build faster thing. Hmm. Yeah, and even phasing here doesn't matter all that much for map clearing. Because a lot of the time, this build just stands still in the Harbinger pack. And you can, if you blink into a Harbinger pack, you can then blink out with Frost Blink. Ooh, vial. Wait, why am I getting so many vials? I have never gotten this many vials clearing temples before. What the heck? Also for good vials. Cuz <laughs> Yeah. People always tell me, oh, make your builds faster, make your builds faster. And I'm going to be honest with you. Some builds are faster. But a lot of builds that are faster than this, I do not enjoy playing. My general goal is I want to be able to juice my map up decently. Put in things like Legion, Harbinger maybe breach, whatever you want, and clear it in around five minutes. I've done some content. Ooh, nice. I've done some content that's faster. Uh, like I did a low investment beast mapping strategy on my RF jug. I did have to increase my RF jug speed significantly for that because that's just maps per hour. The more maps you do, the better that you do. But I'm going to be honest. I don't enjoy most fast builds. Like, people say Tornado Shot Deadeye. I used to play Tornado Shot Deadeye. I don't think I'm ever going to play Tornado Shot Deadeye again. Because I just... I hate the feeling of going fast. It's why the most miserable build I've played in recent history was a very fast Corrupting Fever Gladiator 
with Headhunter. And like, it just wasn't fun. It was so stressful to play that I almost quit the league after two weeks. Instead, I rerolled into Cast on Crit Forbidden Right. And that was absolutely a great decision. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Wait, S Simon, you get currency by playing? I get currency by not playing. I get currency by doing dumb stuff like this. <laughs> and just getting really lucky. Although, uh, jokes aside, most of my money comes from crafting. So my focus when I'm making a build and putting it together is I wanted to be able to do all content at least okay. But I also don't really care if it's the fastest mapper or anything. I care about being able to take it into pretty much anything I feel like on a given day. And if I can do that, I'm happy. And if I can't do that, I'm unhappy. And I usually spend more currency to improve the build. Hey, that's totally fair. That I do not like tons of buttons. I know, ironic, I'm playing Cold Dot. Uh, tons of buttons I have to hit constantly. Poof, nice. Two down. Balanced as all things should be. Yeah, rolling jewels. Kind of neat. I used to do it with Harvest a lot. Try to get the double and triple crit multi. I don't anymore. Just like how I don't roll sextants. Because while it's very profitable, I don't particularly enjoy it. Although, you know, as you say that, and as I say that, I'm like... I do kind of miss some cluster crafting. Maybe next league I'll do some cluster crafting early on. Because early league cluster crafting is actually quite fun. <sighs> yeah, that's totally fair, Snow. Wait, I can't stand in... Yeah, I can't stand in that. Well, now I know. See, this is why I do bad decisions once. Because I was like, hmm, I definitely can't survive a double, but can I survive a single here? No. Cannot survive a single. I also think part of a reason why I'm so unhappy with people constantly being like, go, 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 faster, faster, faster. Every build has to be fast. Everything in PoE has to be fast. It's just some of the reactions for PUE2 that I find super, super sad. So on the one hand, I'm not going to say you have to like PUE2. But I think it's really sad that people are completely writing PUE2 off based on the pace of play they've seen from a demo which GGG themselves has said is very overtuned and not reflective of the end game. We don't know how fast endgame in PoE2 is going to be. About all we can say for sure is faster than the demo where monsters are much scarier and your gear is much worse than you will actually have. Some people are like, oh, PoE2 is too slow. I'm just not going to even give it a chance. Although it's really interesting because I've looked at a lot of people's reactions to PoE2 stuff. And I do think, or at least I certainly hope, the people saying that they're not even going to try PoE2 because it looks too slow are a vocal, very vocal minority. Now, I think there's a lot of people who are going to say, I tried PoE2 and I don't like it. That is totally fair. And if anyone in chat is like, I don't think I'm going to like PoE2 either. <laughs> then, again, give it a shot. You may not. That's totally fine. But here's the really interesting thing. I've also seen a lot of people from outside the PoE community talk about PoE2. And talk about it incredibly positively. And I'm pretty sure what GGG is doing by splitting the games is trying to make two different games that appeal to similar but slightly different audiences.
And yeah, you're right, Max. A lot of people won't listen. But it is still a bit of a frustration for me. <laughs> and so I'm going to uh, ramble about it a little bit. This is well rolled. Not really. Yeah, um, I can explain a little bit about the discussion in terms of difficulty. What people don't like, or usually, I'm not going to speak for everyone here, and I'm not going to speak for all the time, obviously. But what people often don't like is when they trivialize something once, but then they can't do it again. So if something is always difficult, people tend to receive it fairly positively. Even in the Pewee community, you generally don't hear people saying, you know, oh, Uber bosses are just way too difficult. Instead, it's, oh, well, I played Explody Totems and cheesed all the Uber bosses. And then next league, I play a different build that's a lot weaker of an Explody Totem. And the Uber bosses crush me and I go, well, that's bullshit. The game's cheating. I already beat all these bosses. I should be able to beat them again. Which is partially the player's fault because I think you should always go into different builds and different leagues, treating them as separate instances in terms of difficulty and progression and all that. But it's also partially the game's fault because difficulty in PoE is wildly inconsistent. Partially due to the sandboxy nature. And welcome, Lodador. Hey, a close loss is uh, probably better than a complete brain dead stomp win. Oh, very true, Simon. I completely ignore the Reddit. And in general, when it comes to not just PoE, but most games that I cover, I try to stick with a positive spin. Okay. Positive spin makes it sound like I'm being disingenuous. I try to stick to positive aspects of the things that I cover. So if I don't have anything good to say about a game, there's a very good chance I won't cover it at all. Because I don't see any real value outside of, you know, views and clicks in just tearing something down. Now, if there's something I can do, like, here are some bad things about this, and this is why you can learn from it. That's something I might do. But if it's just, well, I don't like anything about this game, and I don't think it has any redeeming qualities, I'm just not going to talk about it. Because what value is there to me just saying bad thing is bad? So I stick to the positive things, for the most part, about what I like. And if I don't like something, yeah, I'll just talk about something else, because there's plenty of things I like. And honestly, I think there's too much negativity as there is. Poof. Not poof. Fun fact about that. Normally, that's supposed to corrupt into an influenced item. But it doesn't corrupt into an influenced item because the item level is too low to have any influenced mods. So it just goes poof. Oh, that is the Apex of Ascension. There's a couple things you can do at the Apex of Ascension. One, you can add a temple item and a vial to upgrade it, like I did with a Mask of a Stitched Demon there. Or two, the other thing that you can do is you can gamble items. So I could put this uh, where is... Oh, I didn't pick up the belt. But I could put the belt in there and turn it into a different belt and try to get a mage blood. Yeah, I, I'm going to be honest, Simon. I think that the Reddit has caused a lot of damage to the Path of Exile community through stuff like that. And as long as someone isn't 
going out of your way to cause harm, let them play what they want. Now, if someone's going out of your way to cause harm, then calling them out can be warranted. But I'm not talking about, oh, someone's talking about a build they played and they got something wrong. I'm talking about actually going out with the intent to cause harm, like saying, oh, well, if you play the build any other way than this, you're wrong and this and that and blah, 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 blah. And turns out they're wrong about it. I mean, again, I don't really call people out because I have better things to do, but stuff like that is genuinely harmful. Someone's just posting about how they enjoy the build. If a build's bad, so what? Although, uh, if, uh, <laughs> that said, if someone comes to me with a weird build and is like, how can I make this better? Most of the time I'm going to be like, you probably can't. It's probably just a bit too weird. If you're okay with that, play it anyway. But uh, I have noticed a lot of weird builds you can't make them much better than they already are. At least not without very significant expense. Because, yeah, if you throw money at something, you'll make it better. But I'm talking about keeping a build weird while improving it on a budget. <laughs> I was going to say, Lodador probably knows this really well. Yeah. Lodador has done quite a few weird builds, some of which... <laughs> It it was as good as it was going to be. And Lodador's also enjoyed a lot of those weird builds. Again, not saying it's a bad thing if you enjoy it. But there's definitely builds where you have to know, going into this, it's only going to be this good. Never going to be better than that. Dead game, yeah. Isn't everything a dead game, though? <laughs> okay, Snow has found one of the exceptions where if someone comes to me with a weird build and they're like, I want to play CIRF, I'm just going to be like, no, you can't. Because when you have Chaos Inoculation, you cannot activate Righteous Fire because Righteous Fire disables at one life. Okay, fun time. Cups of skill. Enlighten two. Poof. Goodbye, money. Bye-bye. <laughs> That's it. It's all waved to the money. Another Apex. This time, I'm using the Coward's Chain and a Vial of Consequence to get a Coward's Legacy. Oh, 5.5k or 5.450. Someone's been delving pretty hard. Nice. Actually, I'm not sure how many anime fans we have in the chat, but if you watch the Trash Taste podcast, recently Giguk was talking about how he also, he used to cover more negative stuff and now he doesn't anymore because he'd really just rather talk about the things he likes. And yeah, there's occasions where he still talks about negative stuff. There's occasions where I still talk about negative stuff. But I generally try to do it in a constructive way. And I also think for the most part, it's just not what I want to do. Especially as I find that the discussion around a lot of stuff these days, oh look, didn't poof. The discussion in general is a lot more negative than I remember in the past. Yes, <laughs> yes, he did get into gotcha. And then uh, his wallet was very sad. <laughs> <clears throat> I also find a lot of negative stuff gets very over-exaggerated. Hmm. I would be totally down for other colors of sockets. That do different weird things. 
Yeah, if there's a point to it. Like, okay, good example of something that is kind of negative that I talked about. When I was playing Diablo 4, I talked about the things about the Sorceress class that bothered me. Where, as someone who had played it for, I don't know, let's just say a couple hundred hours, here were the things I didn't like about the D4 Sorceress. But the tone there wasn't, you know, oh, the devs are shit. It's like, this is what bothers me. And here are some suggestions which the devs are free to completely disregard. But I think these things are an issue for not only myself, but a lot of other players on the class. Then there are a few people who are like, oh, you're just hating on the game. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I agree. I also don't like this aspect of the class. Yeah, middle color sockets would be interesting. Though, with PoE2 coming up, I also would kind of like meta sockets. Could we see meta sockets in PoE1? I suppose it'd be a little bit like the Squire. But something where you could only put a specific gem type, but it literally adds a socket to your item. How's it going, devil? Uh, I can't 100% answer that, Lodador. But from my understanding, with the little markers here, no. Because there's different positions. There's eight directions that you can use. And maybe that means linking has to be changed. But I'd also imagine there are things that you can do to denote different sockets, because there's also the different shape ones that I personally don't like, because I think they look kind of ugly, but a lot of people find it very helpful for differentiating. No, no, I'm, I'm picking up random gems. I shouldn't be doing that. I mean, if a game's going to take over your life, Baldur's Gate 3 is a pretty good game to do that with. <laughs> I would also say my perspective on the discourse around games like Path of Exile is probably heavily colored by the fact that I make content for a game. Because realistically, I would have a very different perspective on most stuff if I wasn't a content creator. Like, I wouldn't be reading YouTube comments. I wouldn't be seeing people be angry about games. I remember during even some quite unpopular leagues before I was a content creator, I'd have my own opinions. I'd have opinions, you know, from people in my friend group. But if everyone in my friend group was enjoying the game, I'm gonna be honest with you, everyone else, literally every other PoE player could be hating it. I don't think I'd have known. I would have just been like, yeah, everyone loves it. 10 out of 10, best league. See, I have a weak loot filter because I am too lazy to properly customize my loot filter right now to show temple items. <laughs> so that's why I have a weak loot filter. So what I mean by not seeing the hate is if I wasn't a content creator, I wouldn't be going to Reddit. I wouldn't, I barely even watch Twitch streams for Path of Exile. And I don't watch YouTube videos for PoE even as a content creator. So I just wouldn't see it because if I'm going to a Twitch stream, it's probably gonna be for a different game. If I'm watching a YouTube video, it's probably gonna be for a different game.
And so that's what I mean by I wouldn't really see it. That the only time I would have, in the recent past, seen it would be something like when, during Lake of Calandra, people were so upset that even channels like Bellular, who don't really cover PoE stuff, were talking about how Path of Exile players were upset. And until it gets to that range, never would have even seen it. Yeah. And honestly, for a lot of that stuff, if I really followed things, I would have quit Pewee a long time ago. Uh, there have been leagues where even just the YouTube comments I get on my videos make me tempted to quit because it's just so easy to completely lose faith in the community. Okay, uh, you're still trying to start drama when I'm talking about how I don't get involved in that stuff. Yeah, there is <laughs> so much negativity these days that it definitely would ruin the game for me if I looked into it more. And hey, welcome. Thank you for stopping by to say hi. I'm glad you enjoy the content. That's the other thing. Uh, when I say seeing negativity about Path of Exile or other games, if I really followed it, it would ruin the game for me. It is almost always a vocal minority. There are a few people who are extremely annoying and extremely loud. And I'm sure this is the case for every community, but I can only talk about how it's the case for every gaming community I've ever been part of, except for maybe small indie games. Because there's some small indie games where people are just super, super wholesome, to be honest with you. But aside of that, Every community that I've been part of, there's a few people who are definitely the minority who are very loud and often very negative. <laughs> yeah. But I'll be honest, it, it does get exhausting sometimes. And uh, that, that's why you get small rants like the one towards the beginning of a stream about everyone saying, oh, every build has to be super, super fast. Yeah, I bet it's every online community or every online community passed a certain size. Because even when PoE was really small, and if you've been a long, long time player, you'll probably remember this. There used to be a time where you would get significant grief for playing softcore. Because, oh, only real PoE players play hardcore. You're not a real player if you play softcore. You're just a noob. I played a little bit of hardcore back in the day, but I mostly played softcore. Because, don't get me wrong, there is an aspect of achievement to Path of Exile. And occasionally I play Path of Exile in a way where I pursue achievement. It can be very fulfilling and very rewarding due to the difficulty. But for the most part, that's not why I play PoE. I play PoE to tinker with builds, sit in my hideout crafting, and just do neat stuff on builds that complete all the content. And I'm not saying you're wrong to pursue achievement and play, you know, solo, self-found, hardcore, ruthless. If you enjoy that, go for it. But that's really not me. If everyone in PoE played Ruthless, like that was 95% of a player base, I'd probably play Ruthless. Just because the biggest thing that attracts me to a game mode in PoE is the economy. And whichever economy has the most players will be most mature and have the most options. But I don't think I'd play Hardcore. Because having your character get reset to death, well, A... I'm going to be honest, I just don't deal very well with losing my character to something like a disconnect or a crash. <laughs> it's a me thing, but it's also a thing. And B, that's not what I enjoy about the game. I enjoy the build crafting and the tinkering. And it's a lot harder to do that in hardcore. 
And so I'd play the most populated softcore league. It's also why I don't play solo cell phone. It's kind of funny. I'm friends with a couple people who play a lot of solo southbound. And every once in a while, I'll see these comments from people. Like when I'm interacting with them on their Twitch stream or something, someone will be like, oh, I never took you as the sort of person who would get along with an SSF player because everything you do is so different. And that's actually why I really like talking to some SSF friends, because their perspective is so different. Yeah, and it's usually easy for me as well. It just gets difficult sometimes when there are so, so many of the negative comments or the trash comments. Again, I think most people, and even just... If you look at by percentage, right? If 90% of your viewers don't comment and are happy with the game or happy with a video and 10% of viewers comment, and 90% of those are positive, it's only 1% of the audience that's negative. But if your audience is 400,000 people, then that is 4,000 people who are actively attacking you or don't like you. Realistically, I think it's more like 0.1%, but even having 400 angry people is kind of tough to deal with sometimes. And... In terms of what am I looking for on the lightning coils? Plus two gems, generally the best thing. Which plus two gems? Not sure. I'm doing this more to see the total end results than I am to see a specific outcome. So I should get roughly 10 double corruptions and I'll see which I get. I think the big hit on lightning coil right now is AOE. And something like AoE Duration would be the best hit if I was going to use it for my own gear. As for the pace of play in PoE 1, that's why I like that they're adding projectile physics to PoE 2. It's going to be a lot harder for the screen to become a clutter when it's slowed down just enough that you're not generating 500 projectiles per second and when it's slowed down just enough that you can't interact with things off the edge of a screen. Also, the visuals for PoE 2 are much cleaner. Like, if you look at the spark that was showcased from Path of Exile 2 versus the spark in Path of Exile 1, that is so much of a cleaner animation that it's going to be a lot easier to tell what's going on. And I like that GGG is putting in the work to make the visual clarity better. Because one of my big problems with PoE is the visual clarity. Uh, unfortunately, if you want 5,000 projectiles per second, then you'll probably have to play PoE 1. Although, who knows? Because if Tornado Shot exists in Path of Exile 2, maybe you can do something like GMP, LMP, Volley, Greater Volley, Tornado Shot and get 5,000 projectiles per second. And yeah, good point. Uh, proj duration, also quite good. So I went back and forth between Lightning Coil and Cloak of Flame. There is no specific universal reason to use one over the other. Lightning Coil is better if you need the 15% suppression from the Mastery because it has base evasion, and that's what I'm using it for. But Cloak of Flame is better if you don't need that for 15% increased maximum life and fire res. Realistically, if you can fit the Suppress or get the Suppress elsewhere, I think Cloak of Flame is a great option. Ooh, the Ethereal. I remember when the Ethereal was a genuinely valuable card. Hmm. hmm. 
All right, so fun fact about possible outcomes and what I'm doing. My odds are significantly higher to get plus two, plus two gems than a lot of other people's. Because I'm using a fun little trick that I'll talk about when I get to the corruption chamber here. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, Lodator. You've also had a bit more or a lot more success in terms of enjoying the game when you play it since you swapped to the private league. Because that's the other thing. Different play styles suit different people better. At least my outside perception is that you've been a lot happier playing PoE since you swapped to doing the group self-found stuff. Hmm. Yeah, I don't quite have 100% conversion on this build. Whoops, uh, almost died there. I do have... Well, just to go into things a little bit more, it's not actually conversion, it's Fizz taken as. But yeah, I don't have 100%, so the armor from Lightning Coil is nice. But also having Fizz Dot taken as is quite good. So I wouldn't say that is strictly a one or another... That's a trade-off that it depends on your build. For this build, I would rate them pretty equally. I don't have a significant amount of armor. I have enough that it is helpful in some cases, but mostly Fizz Taken As is what I do. All right, so this is an item level 20 Lightning Coil. A lot of the things like Damage Taken As, or no, not Damage Taken As, uh, Reduced Damage Taken, don't roll on this item. It's increased damage, reduced extra from crits, life, energy shield, maybe fizz while stationary, and just the gem rolls. And so, you're much more likely to get an outcome like plus one to level of socketed gems. Also, that was a very cooperative double corruption. Maybe I do have a streamer client enabled. Yeah, uh, recovery, pretty good. I do have to hit my life flask occasionally, like when I have seven stacks of Corrupted Blood. But that was also me tanking seven stacks of Corrupted Blood. The reason I have pretty good recovery, the life flask helps. I've got not very much, but a little bit of regen. And then I have damage recoup. Plus, I'm using Blood Notch, so every time I'm hit, I get health back. Overall, this build is very, very well-rounded. It is not the single tankiest way to build Cold Dot. The single tankiest way would be more of a hardcore thing. Oh, I have a block cap with glancing blows as well to help mitigate some of my damage. It is not the single fastest mapper. That would actually be a righteous fire elementalist. <laughs> it is also not the single best bosser, but it can do all of those things pretty well. And that's what I like about builds. I genuinely prefer... Oh, I've gone the wrong way. All right, I'll have to backtrack. I genuinely prefer well-rounded builds to a build that is the best at one area, but fails in others. Yeah, when I say taken as, I'm talking about damage shifting. So physical damage from hits is taken as lightning on lightning coil. The reason I say this is not conversion is because mechanically the game treats them differently. Number one, conversion follows a set order. Physical damage is converted to lightning damage, is converted to cold damage, is converted to fire damage, is converted to chaos damage. You can skip any one step along that tree or that path, but you can never go backwards. You will never see a modifier that says your chaos damage is converted to cold damage. Also, conversion only applies to hits. You are completely unable to convert the dot from vortex to fire with avatar of fire. It will simply lose its dot. 
because Avatar Fire says cold deals no damage. Taken as, on the other hand, can apply to dots. In the case of Lightning Coil, it doesn't apply to dots because it specifies from hits. In the case of Cloak of Flame, it does apply to dots. And it can go in any direction. But conversion can be done multiple times. You can convert your fizz damage to lightning. The lightning with call of a brotherhood to cold. The cold to fire with cold to fire support. And the fire to chaos with consuming dark. Turning a base fizz spell into a chaos spell. And as a result, damage can only be taken as once. I.e., if I have Fizz taken as for my Lightning Coil, but then I also have Divine Flesh for Ellie is taken as Chaos, I would take 50% of physical damage as Lightning. And assuming no other sources of taken as, none of my physical damage gets taken as Chaos. Uh, yes, I did correct that right after in terms of the it's not taken as it's reduced damage taken. And I did already make a video for Cold Dot. It's been up for a few weeks now. Talked about how I league started it. Uh, I'm not aiming for a specific double corrupt. I'm kind of just doing this to see what it ends up with. But things like duration, projectile, and AoE gems are the most valuable. So, I mean, while I'm not aiming for a specific one, kind of hoping I hit a few of those. You know, make my money back. That kind of stuff. This intro area is always where the build shines because that's where it gets to, you know, do its stuff. And then once I get inside, I just fail at pathing. In theory, what I should do is just swap to shield charge for that, but I cannot be bothered. I cannot be bothered to swap to shield charge just for these temples. It's fine. We'll just go a little bit slower. Besides, give me time to talk about stuff. Hmm. Those don't look very good. Yes. Uh, as a note, I do think even increased damage taken paired with stuff, probably reasonably profitable. Um, increased max life, all that. Just not to the same extent. I should have brought some alchemies to... Those are red blade tramplers. Hmm. I don't think anyone uses red blade tramplers right now. This is why I should have brought currency. Ornate box, give me alchemy. Wait, alchemies probably aren't showing on this filter. <laughs> Alright, let's just hop out and grab some alks. For fun. Do I have any engineering orbs? I bet I don't. I have three. Okay, well, I'm not going to use those. Let's see if we get any fun things from this. Look at Chaos Orb. Nice. Alkit. Monster. Quantity of contained items. Good enough. Well, that was well worth an alchemy. Uh, increase quantity. Plus four chest level. Detonates corpses. Shouldn't stand to that. Uh. Hmm. Yeah, those honestly aren't terrible odds, I'd say. Or at least the low-level ones aren't terrible odds, in my opinion. I've certainly done a lot worse in terms of gambles in Path of Exile. Contain six additional items, cards that give currency. Nice. <laughs> Nothing showed up. Next up, I'll go into the Wealth of a Vol. This is a pretty busy temple. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Yes. So on Cloak of Flame, I would say it's actually kind of a brick to hit the increased life. Luckily, Lightning Coil already has a life mod on it. So the increased life will not brick it in the same way. Also means you can't use it with a mastery. Ooh, Chaos Orb. Picking up pennies. Pennies are fun.
Mm, I'm gonna go to the right here. Hmm. Uh, what do you mean by no blocks on Vols in Craft of Exile? Oh, I should have gone up. Yes. Yeah, that was the context of that. Will it prevent the life mastery from working because it's life tagged? And the answer is unfortunately yes. And I was uh, slightly confused. I was like, wait, Craft of Exile supports masteries now? What's... I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Nebuchadnezzar has done a really good job developing that tool. Anything good? Um, taken as? Open prefix? I think that's an open prefix. Um, leech? 70? I don't know. Leech? Probably not useful. But, you know what? I'm just going to put that all in a tab, and if any of it sells, it sells, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. Yes, that is correct. That the only way to quote unquote block a mod when volleying is to, well, have it present on the item. Because they're all different mod pools. Okay. Well, someone in chat has said plus four ink. Poof. All right. This is all Pathmaker's fault. It would have been a plus four. I have made that mistake as well, that I have had the mastery on when it didn't work or been missing it when it did just because I swapped my gear up and completely forgot. This is a cold dot elementalist. Oh man, Lodador, I, there's a mana stacking archetype that I genuinely miss, which is the old mind of the council. Ooh, that's almost really good. Wait, is this hybrid? Yes, it is hybrid. Cool. So I haven't tried that farming strategy, but I have heard good things about it. Uh, you can no longer use Mind of a Council with spells. It only applies to attacks. Yes, please do put likes on the video if you're enjoying it, because it helps tell YouTube to show this to more people. So if you want to see me gamble away a bunch of money and talk about crafting and that sort of thing in Path of Exile, it's a great way. Oh, why did I pick this up? It's a great way to get more attention on the video and all that. Yeah, what I miss, you know, I should actually probably keep some of these in my inventory. Uh, what I miss is the spell Mind of a Council setup. Quant to rarity stacking. You know, that's a really good question. I would imagine no. Because most other bonuses where it says applies A to B does not allow you to double dip. What build would I recommend to kill all uber bosses in hardcore? And you say no righteous fire or EA champ. Uh, I would suggest EA champ or bone shatter unless you have an extremely high budget. In which case I would suggest Dan's forbidden right build. But I have no idea how much Dan's Forbidden Right build would cost. And even then, you're going to have to be very, very careful of Uber Maven, because you will just die instantaneously if you make a big mistake on that fight, playing a build with self damage.
in general, if you're killing bosses on Uber, on hardcore, you want to go with the most meta thing possible because you're probably going to have to make the character two or three times and you're going to want something really, really good. Especially if it's your first time killing those bosses. So I would very, very, very highly advise that if you're doing this for the first time, go especially EA Ignite Ballistas. EA Ignite Champion will allow you to learn the fights a lot better than other things. Yeah, I saw the Wrath Pith Armageddon stuff. Pretty neat. All right, so I th guess I go up to the Locus of Corruption first. I have played quite a bit of BG3. Uh, I have not played any of Starfield. There are just too many games and not enough time to play them. BG3 is great. In terms of Starfield, uh, part of the reason that I held off was just I was very busy with uh, Torchlight Infinite and Last Epoch. And part of the reason was I expected that there were going to be some bugs and all that that would need a couple of days of patching. And so if I came into it late, it would just be a better game. Uh, from what I've heard, it was pretty darn stable, even out of a box. So that's good. But that doesn't solve the me being busy with games. So well, I'll probably catch up a bit later. Hmm, 30% quant. I think we can do better. Favorite class. Ooh. Hmm. So I had a lot of fun playing an Oath of Vengeance Paladin. You can do a lot of neat stuff with a bard. And I haven't played it yet, but I feel like I'm going to do another playthrough and I'm going to go Druid and I'm going to really enjoy the Druid. I uh, probably should have... Oh, seven. Unique items. I'm going to run out of... 54, you know what? That's fine. Uh, POB for this is in my Discord. I keep all of my POBs in Discord. Number one, because it's much easier to update them and fix things without having to find out every single video that I linked it on. And number two, because I have found that when people are in my Discord, it's a lot easier for them to ask questions and for my community to provide answers to those questions. Because before I did that, what would happen is the default for people would be to DM me a question. And the problem with that is there's only one of me and a lot of people with questions. And so I felt very bad and often did not have the ability to answer all the questions. Because if I get 50 or so DMs in a day after releasing a video, uh, I'm not necessarily going to be able to take the time to, you know, give everyone 15 minutes and answer it. That is more hours than there are in the day. So I've found that having everything in Discord like that, much better. And uh, less stressful for me, because it was honestly very stressful for me. <laughs> Plus, uh, if I could clone myself, I'd be playing three different games right now. I'd love that. Plus, the other thing is, I've noticed that some people will treat a POB as a replacement for a build guide. And they will then get upset at choices in the POB without understanding the context that is explained in the video. And I have noticed a significant reduction to that, putting the POBs in Discord, which is also good.
less upset people on the internet is generally a positive, I would say. And speaking of uh, Baldur's Gate 3, one thing I was really happy about uh, over the, let's just say, one and a quarter playthroughs I've done, my first character was a drow. And the playthrough experience, even in the early game, as a drow is very different from my second character where I went, uh, whatchamacallit, the demon people. I can't remember her name. Why can't I remember her name? Yes, this is live. I'm sure someone has to remember who, who they are, but. Tiefling, yes. Thank you, Lodador. Yeah, my experience on my second character, which is a tiefling, is so different from the drow, and that's really cool. I like that that choice actually matters beyond, oh, hey, you can uh, cast fairy fire. Or other fairly meaningless slash trivial almost cosmetic things. Helps make the world feel like a real place as opposed to just a video game. I don't play Magic anymore, but I did in the past, yeah. Uh, so, first time or second time, Lodador? It was on the first playthrough? Yes. On the second playthrough, I am actually thinking of doing an evil playthrough. And I don't think you can get Karlak. We'll see. I haven't gotten far enough that I even met Karlak on my second playthrough. But I'm not sure which characters are cool with an evil playthrough. I'm going to guess Asterion is. He seems kind of down for anything. Pretty sure Shadowheart is. Uh, I've heard if you're good enough at it, you can even recruit Minthara. I don't think Gale would be okay with it. But I'm not 100% sure. Will's definitely out. There is no way I'm getting Will no, I made a custom tiefling. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Lazel is totally fine with you being evil. She just likes fighting. Being evil involves fighting. Also, though, I haven't decided. I really only did the very beginnings of that playthrough, and I've kept all of my decisions neutral so far. I didn't know you could customize Dark Urge. Look, a divine. Nice. If that's the case, maybe I'll restart that playthrough and actually go Dark Urge. The thing about Baldur's Gate 3, I did not look up anything about anything. 
Okay, I looked up very, very basics in terms of some of the mechanics, like what do karmic dice mean? But in terms of characters and gameplay and all that, nothing. All right, gamble number two, easy money. I think we have turned a profit on that. I mean, it's called Dark Urge, I would imagine. I'd imagine you do some pretty messed up stuff. Oh, yes, I did see it. I just didn't reply to it, but thank you, Lodador. POB is in Discord. Okay, so Dark Urge isn't specifically evil. That makes sense with a lot of what the devs have done. I'm guessing it's, well, you have Dark Urges and you can choose to embrace them or fight against them. Yeah, on my first playthrough, I played through an Oath of Vengeance Paladin. Then it was very much a, I want to get this parasite out of my head, but until I get it out, I'm going to be using it for what it offers me. Whereas for if I'm doing an evil playthrough, or not even if, when I'm doing an evil playthrough, I'm probably going to go for the cartoonishly evil. Uh, I would not particularly care about corrupting things like Blenderbore because they're very niche and price unstable as a result. I know that whatever the end results of a lightning coil stuff, it's going to be pretty consistent because people are going to want it. With Blunderbore, not that many people use it. And that would really be just, uh, in a lot of cases, throwing away money. Oh, my first playthrough is Tactician. I don't actually know if I selected Tactician for the second time. I don't remember. And uh, which sword devil? There was one sword that I got and one sword that I missed. Or at least I think I missed another sword. I'm not 100% sure. It seemed like I missed something, though. Yes, ah, uh, not quite as brutal as, oh, okay, I probably underpriced that. Oh, okay, no, not the sword I got then. Right, I'm going to take that out of my dump tab. Because if someone messages me instantly for it, that probably means it's underpriced. And that'll just go here and I'll sort it out later. Okay, I did not kill the dude fighting the squid. Yeah, I was definitely underpriced. I did not think that a 30% AoE string of servitude was going to be worth over a divine. But that's pretty neat. Oh, God. It's like, where's the thing to teleport to? I'm standing in the middle of the enemies damaging them, but I don't know which thing actually lets them take damage. Favorite companion? Mm. Shadowheart. No, oh, should go back to the unmaking. Okay, I was definitely underpriced. And this is why dump tabs can sometimes be a little bit of a double edged sword. 
5.5. That's a nice bit of profit. Thank you for letting me know. I genuinely didn't think anyone even wanted that. And so I was just like, yeah, I'll toss it into my dump tab. You know, if someone buys it when it goes down to 19C, maybe I get something for it. Poof. Bye bye, chess piece. It was nice knowing you for a very short amount of time we knew each other. Yeah, Shadowheart. She's great. Suppress? Chance against Shocked? Is that hybrid? I hope it's hybrid. Uh, kind of garbage. Kind of garbage. All right. Let's see if this is hybrid. It is! Easy money. What's everyone else's favorite characters in Baldur's Gate 3? And keep in mind, there is no wrong answer. Until there is. Also, yeah, let's keep it spoiler free. Or at the very least, very, very spoiler light. So I, for my first playthrough, went with light type just because that was kind of working with my general Oath of Vengeance vibe, where my character wasn't exactly a goody two-shoes, but my character was also like, I'm an Oath of Vengeance paladin. If there are wrongs in the world that involve separating bodies from heads, I will set them right. <laughs> So, you know, the, the general paladin archetype, but with a little bit of drow flavor. Yeah, I didn't end up using Asterion very much on my first playthrough, which is, I don't want to say a regret because I don't regret the choices I made. I really like the characters I interacted with. But let's just say something that I plan to change for my second playthrough. He is one of the characters that I'm 100% using. His voice actor did an awesome job. Catch you later. Thanks for dropping by, Silvio. Yeah, he's just so well written. I mean, to be fair, a lot of the characters are really well written. Oh, you missed him. Oh. Is it because... The encounter was just a little too violent. Oof. Yeah, um, the only, at least from what I've heard, fairly popular character that I missed on my first playthrough was Minthara. Because uh, the route I took with some of the drow under the absolute was very much the, no, no, you, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You guys will bow to me. I'm the real drow here. And if you don't like that, which none of them did, uh, I'm just going to murder hobo my way through them. And that's exactly what I did. I murder hoboed my way through many of the absolute worshippers. Oh. I, whoops, I don't know why I hit M. I've been playing too many other games. Yeah, I did not miss any character by just walking past them, I don't think. I'd have to go look up the list of recruitable characters to double check that, though. There are definitely a couple like Minthara that I killed. Fighting the whole camp is a, a little bit of a relative term because the whole camp ended up dead. 
But some of them did not die by my hand because I made some friends and the friends helped me. I made some eight-legged friends who significantly helped me in clearing out the camp in chapter one. Oh, no, sorry, that was the second base. Um, also, the first camp with the goblins. So they react very differently to drow, and I also made some friends there who helped me with other things. My general vibe going into enemy bases was if they're not going to attack me, I'm going to make friends with whoever I can and have them. Yeah, I also made the three huge friends. Yes. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, hey, this is enemy territory. Let's see who I can befriend. I don't know. <laughs> Worked out pretty well for me. I mean, I wouldn't go out to dinner with three huge friends. Wouldn't go out to dinner with the eight-legged ones either, to be honest with you. But they were a stand-up help in a fight. That's for sure. Also, for how little screen time he had, True Soul Nair was impressively unlikable. It takes genuine skill to write a character that hateable with that little actual screen time. I really like the way in which Baldur's Gate 3 respected lore choices, like your character's backgrounds, without making you feel like you were ever stuck playing the lawful stupid paladin. Because I never felt like, at least with Oath of Vengeance, I was punished to go outside of the way I was playing my character. Oh, poof. I did fight the Walmart Beholder. Got a cool amulet from the Walmart Beholder, too. And I quite happily did the Grimforge wrong. Probably because I didn't pay enough attention to reading stuff. But you know what? I got an achievement for it. So worth. It's fine. It's fine. Everything was fine. There was only a little bit of lava. And only many turns of kiting things. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. All right, let's see if this goes up, down, or stays the same. Rip. Oh, yeah, that fight, if you do it wrong, it is a huge pain. Good. Put wrong in air quotes there, though. Oh, I missed the currency. I wasn't paying attention. It's okay, though. I'm sure they weren't containing divines anyway. I'm not going to walk over here for six alts. The apex of ascension is right along the way. Nice. 
Hmm. Weakest personality wise or combat wise? Because I very heavily respect both characters. Well, I heavily respect all of my characters. And so I have no idea what her default combat abilities were. And when I say heavily respect, I mean for a while, Will was a bard. It was a phase, okay? <laughs> Eventually, I did respect him back to Warlock with Pact of a Blade, though. That's really fun. Because Blade Pact Warlock, you can kind of just stack charisma and melee stuff. And it seems very similar to a Magus from Pathfinder. Plus, you get Eldritch Blast with Knockback. And Gravity is a deadly weapon. That was a really fun build. Had an absolute blast. Yes, uh, I respect Shadowheart to Light Domain immediately. Like, before I even knew anything about her backstory, practically, I respect her to Light Domain, which, uh, given her backstory, is pretty darn ironic. But given the route that I went with her, ultimately, kind of fitting. Not gonna lie. The way things ended up, it was kind of fitting. So, I won't say I never use mods for games in general though most of the time i do not use mods for games unless they're fixing bugs or unless they're really well done because i often find that my immersion and the experience is kind of interrupted by the way mods interact with the game now that said i think baldur's gate 3 is the perfect setting where mods can blend really really nicely in and so as long as the Magus is balanced, there's a good chance I'll check that out in the future. But I know some people are like, oh, I added uh, Goku to Baldur's Gate 3. And I'm just like, I don't want to play as Goku in Baldur's Gate 3. That's just, no. <laughs> if you want to, that's fine. But that's not for me. <laughs> Yeah, class mods and stuff, that's more like what I would usually do. Well, nothing happened. Rip money. Just rip less money than if it goes down to plus two or to two. Also, I'm going to stop picking up those. Don't think they should even be on my filter. So what is Bladesinger? Blade wielding wizard. Okay. Fire damage leech. Decent gloves. Sort of decent helmet. I don't know how many people care about Fizz taken as plus Omni right now. Hmm. I have never figured out how to get stream elements commands to work on YouTube. If anyone knows how to get them to work. Um, I would say I'd set them up, but more realistically, I would forget to set them up and eventually get help from someone like Snow. But I've never actually gotten them to work. I don't know if that's just because for a long time the Stream Elements bot didn't like living in my chat or what. I do have a full video on Cold Dot. It's pretty good. Very well-rounded league starter. I never really progressed it beyond the league start gearing, though. Mostly just because after that, I got busy playing other games and just recently started playing PoE again. By got busy playing other games, I mean for like a couple weeks. Hmm. 
AC based on in does that end up being game breaking or is that pretty reasonably balanced? Because the other thing about player modded classes that you have to be careful with, sometimes people just make very, very OP stuff. And it wrecks the game's balance. All right. And this gets better. I would say that plus two duration gems and 5% life is absolutely an improvement for that item. I mean, it still exists. So that's always a plus. Uh, Genshin Impact, Lodador. Okay, so they just ported the 5e class. Cool. Okay. So it's not really a high damage output class. It's just a very, very tanky class. Vial of Fate. Spell damage non chaos is extra on a minion one. Damn. That almost reminds me of a monk. Because monks also get ridiculous AC. But if you land a hit, they're not really going to tank it the way a paladin would. Hey, welcome. So... The thing about builds for SSF and the reason there aren't very many guides is your gearing is going to be very personal. And it's really difficult, in some cases impossible, to present a gearing progression path in solo cell found when everyone's acquisition is going to be different. That said, there are some guides that do tend to focus on extremely easy to obtain items. So Zizarin has a whole series of League Starter builds, and most of them can be done in Solo Self Found because they're items that you will find pretty quickly or can craft yourself. Uh, that said, I would never look for a guide as an SSF player where you follow step one and then step two and then step three and then step four. Instead, the steps might be the same, but the order in which you follow them, completely different, and you're going to have to go through that process on your own. I.e., step one might lead to step seven, but then you come back to step four after that. That's just going to be based on what you drop, when you drop it, how lucky you are with the first few applications of your currency, all that sort of thing. Yeah, Bone Shatter or Bone Zone, that's very solid in SSF. Explosive Arrow, Toxic Rain. The Underwater Exploration in Genshin looked interesting. I also did not like Underwater Exploration in WoW. But I think that's more just because of how WoW handled it where it felt like the underwater part was more of a set piece and you were just playing World of Warcraft, but underwater. Whereas in Genshin, they tried to make it meaningfully different. More like actual gameplay. Oh, quantity and rarity. Let's see how many unique maps I get. None. Ornate, I can just click. Divine contains eight additional. Good enough. <laughs> oh, nice. 
hey, come give this area completely far away from where you live money, and you might also get money, but probably not. Also, you should definitely do it. Uh, it's so weird. Quantity contained contains four and contains seven, and then I move away because I didn't read the rest. It's like, loot! Will it kill me? I don't know. Uh, I remember a YouTuber who was talking in one of his videos about how he was getting ads because he made some topics on military stuff. He was getting ads from Lockheed Martin. And it's like, do you want to buy a fighter jet? <laughs> well, I would, if I got an ad for a fighter jet, that would be ridiculous. Like, hey, do you have hundreds of millions of dollars lying around? Yeah, I would avoid SSF until you understand the game better. Now, I haven't played Ruthless at all. I have heard that Chris Wilson and many other people think that Ruthless is a lot more approachable for learning the game because it's much simpler. Ultimately, whether that is a good way to start playing Path of Exile or not comes down to you as a player. For me personally, I'm fine with learning complex things and I really enjoy trade and the economy. So Ruthless would not be a good idea for me. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong key there. Whether it's a good idea for you or not, again, it kind of comes down to how and why you play games. That could be something else to consider, but you'll really want to go into Ruthless without a guide if you're doing that. If you want a guide, I would start in Softcore Trade Learn the game over the course of a league or two, and then swap to SSF when you feel more comfortable. Uh, I level 86 with good Alva. Can you even get an item level 86 temple? For those good Alva mods? Or is that a tier 3 room? I haven't paid attention to item level of any of the temples I've run so far, but I don't think I've gotten any item level 86 bases. Or any good ones. It's just the boss drops, I think. And so the returns so far have been none. Hmm. Attack speed during any flask effect. Surely that's not super valuable. Uh, did I like the ending? Hmm. I was kind of sad. Not because I disliked it, but because it was over. Larian did a really, really good job of making a game where you don't want it to end. Because the most valuable bases are actually not the rares. They're the blue ones that you get from boxes. And unfortunately, I don't think there's any way to make the magic items item level 86. Okay, plus one to le... Yeah, but does that upgrade the boxes? Uh, the reason the magic items are often the most valuable is you can imprint those. So, like, if you get a pair of temple gloves that are magic and great mods, you can imprint fracture, make an... At well, is it worth imprint fracturing this league? I don't know. I know in past leagues it has been, but I don't know the price of imprints or fracturing orbs right now. Uh, no, no. Reject squid. Embrace humanity. Hmm. Okay, I've just been buying random temples, so I haven't really been paying attention to that aspect. Where I'm looking to make money is from the currency drops from things like Wealth of Evolve, 
and the double corruptions, of course. And I'm also gambling some enlightens, which I hit an enlightened four, so I'm probably positive. So I remember that's quite a bit of money. Didn't really look into or consider the bases in terms of 86. Because usually you only need 84. Uh, I, in terms of Wither, I'm a bigger fan of Fane. Fane was one of my favorite characters from Divinity 2. Or Withers, yeah. I know who you meant. How much are the item level 86 Guadalitzi chests? I can't really make any recommendations for console. I've never played PoE on console. And I don't know what is and isn't available there. For example, Righteous Fire might be fine. Because at least on PC... You don't need that many buttons. But also you are replacing a lot of things like you're putting it on, you're putting stuff on left click on PC, which I don't think you can do on console. And you're also often getting automation through investment into your build. I don't know how the market is as sad as it sounds, my general advice in terms of consoles and Path of Exile is kind of just don't. Mostly because I've heard a lot of bad things about Path of Exile on console. I don't have any personal experience with it. Uh, I've heard there's a lot of issues with, like, not a population to interact with optimization problems for PS4 and um, I don't know, what are the Xboxes? I can never remember which Xbox is which anymore because they're all like Series S and Series X and why couldn't we just have Xbox 360 going into Xbox 720? I can remember 360 and 720. Yeah, I've heard it's rough and I certainly hope that improves at some point. But I would only play PoE on console, A, if you're okay with it being kind of meh, and B, if you really can't play it on PC. That's fair. And I've never really heard bad things about the controller support. It's just that everything else is kind of rough. Oh no. Uh One of these days I'll probably have to actually play Path of Exile on console to see if it's really that bad. But right now, 
I'm just going off of what people said. And uh, yeah. Generally, I hear a lot of complaints about console, unfortunately. And my paladin was Lothsworn. So whenever I had the option to make a pro Loth decision that didn't involve killing a bunch of people, I did it. I know at some point, GGG said they wanted to have more cross-platform support for consoles, but they're having difficulty basically getting it approved by the console makers. I don't know if it was Microsoft or Sony at fault or both. I mean, both wouldn't surprise me. Also wouldn't surprise me if Microsoft was fine with it and Sony was like, no. That does tend to be what happens with games, unfortunately. That's a, a lot of scorpions. Can we not? Too many scorpions. Oh, that's, that's rough. I've also heard the market boards are just very rough to navigate when gearing your character. And that they were hoping to go to a PC style listing instead of the market boards at some point. But I don't know if that stuff is happening still. Or if it's one of those they wanted to, but couldn't. Yes. Oh, speaking of item level 86 gloves, it might be worth something. Maybe those. Also, just to be clear in terms of my stance on consoles and all that, the only current gen console that I own is a Nintendo Switch. I think for the most part, buying games on consoles horribly overpriced in comparison to Steam. And in general, if you have, you know, the option to get a game on PC, you're probably going to have a better experience due to mods. There are some exceptions, like Square Enix games that do generally run better on PlayStation 5 and PC, but most games will be better on PC than console. And that's not really a specific, you know, one console of the other thing. In terms of specific consoles, recently, Microsoft and Xbox have done more pro-consumer things than Sony and PlayStation, because Sony and PlayStation are the market leader. I like it when console makers do pro-consumer things. And ultimately, if I had a PlayStation, I'd probably play some stuff on it. If I had an Xbox, I'd probably play some stuff on it. But I don't. And so I play stuff on PC. And I think the whole console war is stupid. I think people who are doing things like getting mad at Alana Pierce for being a Sony employee playing an Xbox game and enjoying it are out of their minds. But I guess... A lot of that is people justifying the sunk cost fallacy when the companies have turned it into a zero-sum game for their own profit. Because realistically, I do not think most console-exclusive games should be console-exclusive. Yeah, that comes of uh, the trade board stuff, comes of a cost of reduced functionality in terms of searching, though.
At least that was my understanding. But yeah, the tribalism, I mean, even in Path of Exile, you see it. When I was playing Diablo 4, some people were legitimately upset that I was enjoying a Diablo game. Because as a PoE player, you can't like a Diablo game, apparently. It's like, no, when D4 came out, I enjoyed playing it. And then D4 Season 1 came out, <laughs> and I got bored very quickly because very little changed. And uh, Blizzard is promising a lot of content for D4 Season 2. I'm a little concerned they are going to overpromise and underdeliver. But if Season 2 is an awesome season, and the game's fun, absolutely going to play it again. Uh, I don't quite remember what you mean about that one, Devil. Yeah, I don't get why a lot of people are as mad about things as they are, to be honest with you. Yeah, if you like it, you play it. And there's very few games... I'm sure there are games where you could argue that someone is a worse person if they play it. Uh, those games involve illegal things. But if it is not a game involving illegal, very heinous things that we all as a society can agree should not be made into a video game or included in a video game, it shouldn't matter. Oh, no, I didn't get a game over that way. Probably because my character as a paladin was generally pretty respectful towards deities. He was like, yeah, you might not be my god, but I'm a paladin. I get it. And so I would imagine that if you push your luck, you could absolutely get a game over that way. Hmm. So what I heard is the general search functionality is much more limited on console in that you can't do things like live searches, but maybe they've added that more recently because most of my console PoE knowledge is from a very long time ago. Oh, I've seen PoE players get mad at me for playing Last Epoch. Several PoE players got mad at me for playing Last Epoch. Uh, Several times, actually. <laughs> no, some people are just very tribal, and if you don't play the one thing that they want you to play, they get angry. I've also had last Epoch players get mad at me for playing PoE. That's a funny one. I don't really know the D&D lore, to be honest with you. I play Pathfinder, but I play in a homebrew world. And so traditional lore stuff, I'm just kind of like, eh, what's that? I kind of know. I know what a paladin does. And that's about it. As for people being mad buying Blizzard games, 
The thing is, most of the people who are mad at other people for buying Blizzard games also buy Blizzard games. Hmm. 90 life. That's pretty neat. What class from Pathfinder 2nd Edition? You know, I haven't really played very much Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I've only really played Pathfinder 1st Edition. And in terms of what would I want from Pathfinder 1st Edition, Bolt Ace. So, uh, full disclosure, I... Ended up getting Diablo 4 for free, but I was going to buy it, both because I was personally curious about the game and because it was big enough that I kind of had to cover it. Ultimately, I ended up enjoying the game more than I expected to. That the initial campaign, very fun experience. The end game definitely got tedious, the more I did it, but it started off pretty good. And it was, at least for me, as someone who likes trying things, new experiences, etc. I definitely got my, what would have been money's worth if I had just bought it. Because I took my first character, a sorceress, all the way to level 100. I tried a bunch of different builds, all that stuff. I do think as a live service ARPG, it is a subpar product. And if you are looking for something where you pay $70 and you get 10,000 hours, it's not there yet. It needs a lot more work. But if you judge it in comparison to buying any other AAA title and playing through it, I do think you get roughly the same value for money that you do from a lot of the others. Although, also... I'm kind of a big fan of shorter games, especially these days when there are so many live services. I find myself appreciating games like Armored Core 6 a lot more, where the game is relatively short and it tells its story, it has good gameplay, the moment to moment is great. Armored Core 6 is an awesome title. Also, welcome, Dread. And I kind of wish more games were like that rather than being these big live services. It's also why I play quite a few indie games. Need to find time to play Sea of Stars, speaking of indies. That game looks awesome. I take it you were streaming some Last Epoch? Or were you playing something else today? It'd be hilarious if YouTube was like, we are now supporting cross-platform raids. Twitch would hate it. Twitch would be like, you can't do this. You're stealing our viewers. Uh... Something tells me you don't actually have 50 Apothecary Gambles. But if you have 50 Apothecaries that you want me to destroy, uh, I would be happy to do that. But gambling on this channel is uh, strictly BYOG, or bring your own gamble. I'll click the button for you. Oh. Okay. Um, I think I could put this on if I wanted. Because that's duration AoE gems. So yeah, uh, if there was anything that I wanted to hit, wanted being a very broad term here, I think I just hit it. I 
I think that's a few divines. Maybe. Also, if someone had me do 50 apothecary gambles, I would put a stipulation that if there are more than five mage bloods at the end, one needs to be double corrupted. <laughs> that would be my condition for doing that. Hmm. I mean, it being six linked doesn't matter, though. Good question, Marco. That would definitely be quite nice. Yeah, AoE duration would... Mm, I guess duration doesn't apply to Impending Doom. All right, I want to see those Apothecaries snow. Let, let's see what you've been farming. I think I did this. All right. So the reason I'm not too worried about it being six linked or not. Oh, wait, wrong. All right, 23 is good enough for now. See if I can actually literally just put this on for fun. Four linked sockets. No, no, no. I'm going to call your bluff. Let's see him. Cool. It is now six linked. Color wise. Blue, 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 blue. I'm going to double check something. Good old Verici calculator. I swear, this is the best add-on ever made for poe it's right up there with path of building so one one four no well, three blue pretty expensive definitely a tainted chrome no didn't hit all right so i guess this gets to live in here for now because that's pretty darn good. Oh, I did not know that paladins had god-specific lines like that. That's, wow. That's really cool. Yeah, Craft of Exile is very good. Also, I have a couple times had the pleasure to speak to... Nebuchadnezzar, the dev that runs Crafted Exile, and he's wonderful. So yeah, I'm gonna, gonna just show someone. Do a little uh, screen cap here. Yeah, uh, this stream has been a success. We are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So halfway in, and I've already <laughs> paid for everything with a single chess piece. Minus actually fixing it with colors. 
pretty darn neat. Note, do not necessarily try this at home. Your results may vary. But uh, yeah, that's pretty darn fun. Okay, since I have a good few people here, I bait everyone in with the gambles, and then I ask the real questions. So, when you are not playing Path of Exile or any other Diablo-like ARPG, so not Path of Exile, not Sacred, not Torchlight Infinite, not Diablo 2 or, or D2R, none of those games. When you're not playing games like that, what do you play? either genre or specific games. Oh, this is Storm of Corruption for the quant stuff. I should be standing in the puddles. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, wasn't off cooldown. Hmm. How is Warframe these days? I last played Warframe right around when Planes of Eidolon came out. League of Legends. Oh, we've got some self-haters in chat. Got a lot of self-haters in chat. Wow, Classic Hardcore. What is the craziest thing you've died to so far? Souls games and FIFA. <laughs> you know, for as popular as it is, I've talked to a surprisingly few number of people who have played FIFA. I know it's huge. It's just so different from most of the games that people I talk to play. Also quite different from Souls games. Play a good few Souls games, although I wouldn't say it's necessarily my favorite genre. A sort of genre where when I play it, I like it a lot, but I generally like it in moderation. Rocket League, that's another pretty popular one. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, there's a huge portion of PoE gamers who are also only PoE gamers. So that's not that unusual. Yep, Magic the Gathering. <laughs> oh, if a PoE fan is saying something has a necessary currency, you know it's bad. That's how you know they've really gone too far. Ah, oh, fighting games. What was the last fighting game I played? Multiverses. Command and Conquer RTS. Yeah, that is a classic. I played a ton of Red Alert games, especially Red Alert 3. And every once in a while, I still play Age of Empires 2. Really good RTS. Yeah, the best thing about PoE is exactly that you can take a break. And Chris Wilson talks about this a lot. Where he wants PoE to be the game that will always be there. And so if there's ever a league where you're like, I'm just not feeling it. Take a break. Don't force yourself to play. We're talking about just games you play. I mean, I certainly hope you like the games you're playing. But it doesn't have to be. You could be a League of Legends player. <laughs> Absolutely hate what you do. Okay, uh, just to be clear, I don't think all League of Legends players hate the game. I, I just find the meme funny, so I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> oh, nice. I nulled that and increased the value. 
The other fighting games that I tend to play aren't super serious ones usually. I guess Rivals of Aether, which I didn't play a ton of, but I did like. That's more towards the serious end. Then you have Smash, which I'd say is less towards the serious end. Not for very isn't competitive Smash, but it's not made as a game that's competitive first. It's, you know, party game first, competitive second. Uh, Soul Calibur. Haven't played any of the new ones, but I've played a bit of, especially Soul Calibur 2, 3, and 4. I think it was 2, 3, and 4, yeah. Doom-like shooters. You know, haven't played Doom that much. But I'm just talking about games, uh, in part because I like to know what other people are playing. And in part because over on my second channel, I talk about other games. It's always interesting to see what people might be interested in, because sometimes it's a game where I play it. And I'm like, no one cares about this, right? A good example of this is the remade Pharaoh City Builder, which was one of Sierra's city builders from, I'd like to say, the 90s. Would anyone care about that? I have no idea. In a world where we have city skylines too, maybe people like city builders. But maybe people are like, that's just some ancient game. Don't care. So it's always interesting to me to see what else other people are playing. And I can go, oh yeah, I played that. Uh... Pathfinder stream like Pathfinder Kingmaker or like the tabletop game? Because the tabletop game, probably never. I play the Pathfinder tabletop game with some real life friends. And that's just one of those personal things that I'd rather keep personal. Pathfinder Kingmaker? Maybe. I don't know. I've no specific plans for it. But it's also a pretty good game. And I'm not opposed. So we'll see. The Greek one, Zeus, Master of Olympus. Yes, that was actually my favorite of the three. Uh, I think it was the least balanced. Balance wise, I'm pretty sure the Caesar line, the Roman one, was definitely the most balanced. But man, just having gods walking around in your city, it's cool. I love that. It was great. Rumbleverse, no. There was another one though. That I guess it wasn't Battle Royale fighting per se, but V Rising, which was survival game meets uh fighting game mechanics, or I guess more of MOBA mechanics than fighting game. I did play V Rising. I did not like the public servers because I have a very low tolerance for griefing. But I did quite enjoy the single player. And I feel like V Rising is a sort of game where I'd have fun playing with friends where you can set basic don't be a dick rules. Because on the public server, the first thing I encountered was a guy griefing people so they couldn't progress past copper. It's like, why? Why are you doing that? Come on. Why you gotta grief people? I like Frostpunk a lot. It's a really fun game. And it reminds me that I need to check out, I think it's Beyond the Storm. Beyond the Storm seems to have some similar survival-esque aspects in its city building mechanics. And what I like about Frostpunk is it's a little bit less of a sandbox where the really sandboxy city builders, this is probably a me thing, but I very often find I build them all exactly the same way. I get into a pattern, even in Barrow, where I just build every city exactly the same because I can. I like how in Frostpunk, you can't do that. If I remember, there's a Frostpunk 2... Coming soon? Maybe in early access? Languishing on Epic Games? I don't know. I should catch up to see the status of that.
Yeah, genre mashups are neat. Yeah, I also just like talking about games with people, which is one of the reasons why I started making content. I'm trying to remember which Monster Hunter I played. I haven't played very many of them, but I played one of them on the DS, and I was very surprised that the controls were as good as they were. That was not the sort of game where I expected it to actually play well on the DS, but it did. I'd probably have to Google Monster Hunter DS to know which one it was, or go check my shelf over there. But one of those things requires Googling and the other requires getting up, so probably neither are going to happen when Chad is around to give me all the answers. Maybe. The last big Monster Hunter clone that I heard about was the Koei Tecmo game, right? Uh, what was it called? That one had a really cool aesthetic to it. Wild Hearts. But I also heard the optimization was pretty poor, unfortunately. Oh, half of them were on the DS. Well, I have no idea then. <laughs> uh, I played one of them on the DS. It was a good time. Uh, I tried playing Monster Hunter World when it came out. Unfortunately, that wasn't a good time. Uh, the optimization was sadly pretty poor. Though I heard that got fixed over time. What's the corrupt luck? You know, I think I'm doing better than average so far, but I don't know by how much. Oh, if you like Slave Aspire and Risk of Rain, have you played Monster Train? And as for Devil's question of, do I think the gaming industry is the biggest in the world? Probably not. I think it's big. But I think it's probably approaching or surpassing television. But I don't think it's the biggest industry in the world. It's just the biggest in entertainment, which I think is what you mentioned in your question. And I don't know if it actually is in a cohesive way. Because when I think of gaming, there's so many different types. There's AAA gaming, there's mobile gaming, which I'm sorry to be that guy, but I'm going to be that guy. A lot of mobile gaming isn't real gaming. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's a casino with extra steps. Um, wait, did I click all the things over here? I don't know if I did. And so, because it's not so cohesive, even if it might be the biggest by revenue, I don't know how to feel about that. Uh, is it worth starting Hexblast Mines, and how much do you need to start? Well, if you follow Maxwell's League Starter, you need nothing at all in terms of initial currency. Because that is made for someone who starts with absolutely nothing day one, naked on a beach, and goes all the way to endgame. And is it worth it to start that? I mean, are you looking for a League Starter? Because the answer is yes in that case. If not, what are you looking for from a build? Because, like, if you're looking for a fast mapper, no, I wouldn't start Hexblast Mines. If you're looking for a Sanctum Runner, it's pretty decent. If you're looking for a bosser, it's quite good. Um, What else can and can't it do? I don't think it's that good at Legion or Breach. Pretty good for Harvest. Pretty good for Expedition. Yeah, so Monster Train is a deck builder card game. And in comparison to Slave Aspire, 
it's a little bit less focused on the deck building aspect, but the gameplay space is on a train. And so it brings this really cool 3D aspect to it. And it's the sort of game where when I had played Monster Train for about 20 hours, I was like, oh, Slave Aspire, better game. And then I played Monster Train for 100 hours. And I was like, you know, the gameplay of Monster Train is really, really good. I'm very glad I played this. And so I ended up preferring the deck building in Slave Aspire to the deck building in Monster Train. The gameplay in Monster Train to the gameplay in Slave Aspire. Just to change builds. And for Sanctum, yeah. And if you want to have one that's already up and running off the top of my head, I don't really know what budget to look for. But uh, let me grab something really quick. Hopefully YouTube won't eat the link. Uh, here we go. This is my second channel, Slave Aspire Review. What game disappointed me most? Hmm. So a game that disappointed me the most has to be one that I was highly invested in and I had a lot of expectations for. So for example, Diablo 4 did not particularly disappoint me. Because I went into it with the expectation of, oh, this probably isn't really going to be for me, but it'll be fun for a bit. Ultimately, I still don't think it's for me, but it was fun for a bit. And I enjoyed my time playing it. Second season was a little dis... Or the first season was a little disappointing. But not too bad. So when I think of a game that I was more invested in, that disappointed me... Uh, I was a little disappointed in myself playing Darkest Dungeon. Because I like a lot of things about that game. But once I kind of saw through the gimmick and saw through the fact that if you just treat your characters as disposable, it trivializes a lot of it. That kind of ruined the game for me. I don't know if that was necessarily the game's fault. So there's also Magic Legends, which was a shit show. But I went into that expecting for it to be a shit show that I laughed at. Um, Diablo Immortal disappointed me. Because I didn't think they'd be quite so mask off about it. But it's not like I had high hopes for that. I would say... Hmm. The game that disappointed me the most would either be World of Warcraft or Wolsen Lords of Mayhem. World of Warcraft disappointed me because I enjoyed certain aspects of it, especially the raiding and playing with friends. I didn't like the focus on dailies, having anything be a potential upgrade, and the sorts of stuff that made WoW start to feel like a job. And so in that regard, for any live service that I've played for a long time, WoW was the greatest disappointment. But then for games that I didn't have a long history with, Wilson Lords of Mayhem, because I played Wilson in the beta. And I preferred the beta, or sorry, I played it in the alpha. And I honestly preferred a lot of the principles and ideas from the alpha to the implementation in the beta. And I've gone back to Wilson several times. I'm probably going to go back to it at least once more because they got a big endgame patch. And every time there's just something missing. And the devs clearly, you know, put in the time, right? They're not lazy or anything like that. But it just, it's always missing something. And it's so disappointing. I played WoW from Wrath of the Lich King to Legion. And towards the latter half of that, I raided with a fairly high end, top 30 to top 20 US guild. And I believe my guild, which was Healer Chat or HC, is still in that top 20 to 30 US ranking. 
But the more I pushed into the upper competitive echelons, the more I felt like the aspects of a game that I wanted to play and enjoy were going cross-purpose with what I had to do to be competitive. And so one of my favorite times was Warlords of Draenor. HC wasn't its most competitive at that point. But we were pretty competitive. And you could just raid. Like, the raiding was hard in Warlords. But it was fun. And you didn't have to do a billion dailies and worry about your artifact power. Or anything like that. And I'm not saying Blizzard shouldn't make things like artifact power or dailies for casual players to enjoy. Because I know a lot of people who do enjoy those aspects of WoW. They shouldn't force hardcore, quote unquote, or raiding players to do them. That's where the problem I have with it is. And so, yeah, I fell out of love with WoW. I don't know that I could ever go back to it and play casually. See, with Lost Ark, I did eventually stop playing it because eventually I wasn't too happy with the fact that all my friends quit. But while my friends were playing, I was enjoying it. Oh, yeah, I've talked to someone who enjoys dailies. Uh, his name is Milky BK. Some people like logging in and doing the same things every day. It's kind of the same as in a farming game like Stardew Valley where tending your crops is kind of just meaningless busy work. Though I don't mind the tending your crops in those games because they're very intrinsically motivating. Whereas it always felt like once you start getting power tied to things like dailies, it becomes extrinsically motivating and also somewhat toxic by design. A good example of this is there are people who have the perception in high-end rating that if you don't keep up with your dailies, because your character isn't as strong and because as a result, you're wasting other people's time, you are a lesser human being. And I've seen this attitude before. I don't agree with it. I think it is fair to say, if you're on a raid team, you need to pull your weight and you should not waste other people's time. But just because someone is not able to pull their weight does not make them a worse human. At that point, it is the responsibility of the guild's officers and leadership to make the decision, are we okay slowing down to the pace of our current weakest member? Or are we going to do the difficult thing of saying, you know, hey, this is nothing personal, but we're going to replace you on the raid team because we need to progress and we can't have one person hold back the rest of a raid by this much. One person's always going to hold back the rest of a raid. You're always going to have that weakest player. But it's a matter of degrees. Sometimes the weakest player is going to be a little weaker. And sometimes the weakest player is going to be the source of 50% of your wipes. And if they're the source of 50% of your wipes, that's a problem. And if you're a serious guild, you should replace them. I noticed... In some high-end rating guilds, but honestly, thinking about it more, actually more in casual guilds, people would just be really toxic to the weak players. They wouldn't look to replace them. They'd just be mean to them. It's like, don't be mean to them. Be honest with them. Ooh, AOE gems increase damage. Okay, maybe I do have a streamer client. <sighs> yeah, while players are kind of hostile to new players, I think... Unfortunately, PoE can be somewhat the same. It's just a long-running game thing. Like, I remember a video that Josh Strife Hayes did with the Lazy Peon and MMO Byte and Asmongold talking about content creation for MMOs. 
And man, if you had just replaced the word World of Warcraft with Path of Exile and Final Fantasy XIV with the word Diablo, so much of it still applied, both in terms of the positives and the negatives. I really think people get very invested in long-running games. That can be a good thing. Passion, when it comes to a game, can be great. Oh, wait, this isn't a level three. Whoops. But it can also be a bad thing. It can lead to a lot of hostility and meanness and rudeness. Uh, actually, Dan Olson has an amazing video called Why It's Rude to Suck at Warcraft, where he goes over how because add-ons exist, it incentivizes the developers to design and balance the game around those add-ons existing. And therefore, players are often hostile to those who don't use the add-ons because you can't perform as well. Uh, I'm not looking for AoE in duration. I already hit that. But yes, if I was doing it for just an upgrade, which was actually kind of how this whole thing started, I was like, oh, I'll make a chess piece. It'll be a fun video. But then I was like, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to do a bunch of double corrupt. And then stream it and all that. And so here we are. And so at this point, we're just kind of chilling, having fun, wasting money. Well, not really wasting money because I've made money. But the initial idea was to waste money. It's not going well. You mean like Diablo 4 hiring a Chris Wilson? If that's what you mean by divergent Chris Wilson, uh, A, that's great. And I'm definitely going to have to use that. But also, uh, I think it is either a very intentional move by Blizzard or a very unfortunate coincidence that that name and that man are fronting that game. Because it's going to be really hard to be Diablo 4 Chris Wilson. Like, imagine... Imagine if you were, let's just say, a physicist named Stephen Hawking. And you're not the Stephen Hawking, you're just another Stephen Hawking. Like, it's just got to be so rough. <laughs> uh, Divergent Chris Wilson, I like that. So now EHG needs to hire Chris Wilson and we can have anomalous Chris Wilson. Uh, and I don't know who will be phantasmal Chris Wilson. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I mean, I hope he does well. I really do. Because I think that the genre is healthier when multiple games do well. I also think, ultimately, competition is good. Even if there's not necessarily a lot for PoE to directly copy, there's a lot to get inspired by. Oh, Amazon, yes! Phantasmal Chris Wilson can come from Amazon. He can be in charge of Amazon's new Lord of the Rings ARPG. I don't know if Amazon's making one of those, but it'd be hilarious. At this point, they probably are. Also, uh, how to make people mad in five seconds. Diablo 2 is a roguelike. Discuss. Keep it civil, though. I talked to quite a few Diablo people. I'm going to have to mention the Divergent Chris Wilson thing next time. Because that's great. Okay, so think of this for a second. 
what's the definition of a roguelike? And I'm going to use the broader one rather than the strict definition. So it doesn't have to be ASCII. It doesn't have to have no meta progression. Really, I'm using the casual roguelite slash roguelite or like slash light definition of it here. But what is at its heart a roguelike? And uh, to be clear, I did steal some of this idea from Adam Millard, who has some excellent video essays. But the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. In a roguelike, you start in an area, and you kill a bunch of enemies to acquire loot and get stronger. And a lot of the gameplay comes down to your resource management. In Diablo, let's say Diablo 2, you start a new character. You can potentially play in such a way that your progression does not persist past that character's death. And you enter areas to manage resources, which in this case is no longer health, but is your burr runes that you will absolutely run out of immediately before you get an enigma. And try to progress. Furthermore, David Brevik has gone on record multiple times, including recently at Exocon, to say that Rogue inspired him when he was making Diablo. It's not the only inspiration, but it is an inspiration. And so you could say that Diablo and Path of Exile are roguelikes. Uh, I would say, by design, Baldur's Gate 3 is not a roguelike. Because, yes, it does have some similarities in the way I just described it. And that's, in part, the fault of my description. So by how I described it, yes. But adding in things like how the narrative drives the gameplay forward in Baldur's Gate 3? Maybe not. Because a lot of Diablo-like games are very heavily loot-based. And sure, you can focus on loot in Baldur's Gate 3. But it is clear that loot is not the developer's focus. Also, if we include Rogue Light, or even Rogue Like here, what about seasons? You keep your progression within a season, but at the same time, between seasons it gets wiped. Hmm, huh. is WoW hardcore a roguelike? I'd also say no, but I would say it is a rogue inspired game mode, or way to play World of Warcraft. You could certainly make an argument that WoW is a roguelike. And here's where I'm going with all this. As you start to look between games and see similarities, there's a surprising amount between different genres. There's usually enough nuance that you can disagree with it. But there's also enough nuance that there are similarities. And here's the interesting part about that. The ARPG genre encompasses a lot of games which are not referred to as ARPGs by people who play Diablo-like games. As for poofs, I've gotten three poofs so far. Is every game a roguelike? I mean, maybe if you try hard enough. But generally, I would say no. In general, I would say that 
most games that are roguelikes have to have enough elements from it. So just having ASCII art does not make something a roguelike. Just having some sort of permadeath or progression loss on death doesn't make it a roguelike. Just being loot focused and played across multiple runs doesn't make it a roguelike either. But if a game has all of those things and a few more, yes. As I remember, a group of people got together and officially codified what a roguelike was and came up with a very strict definition. Now I think that definition is probably too strict. But I also think it's interesting that people were able to do that. Okay, maybe I do have streamer RNG because I was totally expecting that to move. You know, I can actually see that Baldur's Gate 2 had a lot more roguelike elements than Baldur's Gate 3. Yeah, I mean, even think about the Forbidden Sanctum. And look at the way in which the gameplay differs from normal Path of Exile gameplay you're much more focused on what's directly in front of you. What's in this room and how that affects what's going to be in the next room. Uh, I did not. In fact, I'm not sure I even knew that was an option. I'm not surprised, given everyone else that you could sleep with. But I don't remember that I saw that as an option. The problem with how long the game was, it all kind of blurred together for me. And I don't remember all of my decisions anymore. That's why I need to play through it again. And then maybe make a video about it so I can look back at the video and remember, oh yeah, I did do that. Or, oh yeah, I, I totally did this thing that was completely antithetical to someone's entire identity. Like, um, how I respect Shadowheart to a light domain cleric. <laughs> oh god, from a lore perspective, I'm a monster. But from a getting a nice fire damage AoE and fireball perspective, 10 of 10 would respect Shadowheart again. That sounds reasonable. I don't see anything wrong with that devil. Poof. Damn it. <laughs> oh no. Nothing's poofing. People are going to think I'm cheating. Uh, you can't play Ignite Cold Dot. There's no way to do both at once. You are either Ignite using Vortex, or you are Cold Dot. But no, I'm not Ignite Vortex. Oh yeah, I convinced the Surgeon to completely just go against everything. Or not really go against everything, but just be a, a demonstration for the rest of us. Let's just say it that way. Hmm. 
I mean, why be Ignite Vortex? Hmm, <laughs> I don't think that's quite good enough. Oh, wait. Wasn't this for one that was 5.5 divines? Yeah. Oh, cool. I got another five divine string of servitude. That's kind of neat. Wait. Prefix, 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 suffix, suffix. I think you could go Flicker Trauma even without Baronastra. I don't believe Flicker's weapon specific. But yeah, it's kind of neat. Oh, so I don't have any super strong reason for one over the other. I just played Cold Dot as my league starter and then didn't change my build after that. that there is no specific reason why I'm not a different build. I guess the only reason would be that if I was going to play an Ignite build, I probably wouldn't play Ignite Vortex. I would probably play... I've done Wave of Conviction recently, so not that. I don't think Ignite Arc's good enough. I don't know. I'd want to do something I haven't done before. Or something that I have done, but not recently. So I'd probably try to do some sort of heat shiver ignite. If I was going to play with... Mm, no, never mind. Heat shiver is way too meme. No, I, if I was going to play an ignite build... It would be a melee ignite build with the whatchamacallit support. The thing for stacking ignites, controlled blaze. But also if that's bad, then I'd, I'd just not play an ignite build right now. It's probably bad, to be fair. Haven't looked into it. But it's probably bad. Yeah. The kill speed is definitely good on... 60-ish divines for Vortex Ignite. I just don't think it's meaningfully different enough from what I'm already playing to justify a regear to me. And that's not meant to be a, oh, it's a bad build or anything. It's just, I'm already playing Cold Dot. Might as well just stick to Cold Dot. If I was going to play a different build, I'd want to make it really different. Because realistically, for how the build plays, it doesn't meaningfully change by that much. Just a little bit. Um, I don't know that you'd really want to do Oriaths on VLS, just because VLS already clears so well that adding more clear doesn't necessarily help you much. But if you have the money to afford an original Sin build, I would say try it. Because you probably have the money to buy the Oriaths. Try it, and if it doesn't work, resell it for, I don't know, small profit, half a div loss. Hmm. So, my understanding of the support, having not P.O.B.'d it, was you needed very specific damage thresholds. Where you got exactly the right amount of attack speed, and then you played it on a Juggernaut, 
so that you could stand in literally everything. Because if you weren't able to stand in everything, you were not going to be able to have high enough uptime on a boss to actually min-max it. But that could be wrong, because I didn't look into it that much. And speaking of stuff like that, that's why I really like doing the meta report series. Because I get to look into a whole bunch of different builds, and sometimes I learn quite a lot about builds. Sometimes there's stuff that <laughs> I don't get right, and people are very quick to tell me. But as long as you're not an asshole about it, that's totally fine. One thing that ended up surprising me is how effective Spellblade and Sacrifice became. Uh, it depends on the character devil. I did multi-class some, but not all of my characters. Uh, Karlak, for example, I multiclassed. Whereas Shadowheart, pure cleric. I went back and forth on my main character paladin and what I was going to do, but I ended up being pure paladin. Yeah, you don't need that much DPS to do most content. Hey, how's it going, Zeta? No Scorchedin or Palalock. I was considering going, uh, whatchamacallit? Bard. I was considering dipping into Bard. But ultimately, I couldn't quite figure out how to make that work. Probably because I didn't spend very much time on it. Yeah, Calm Spirit to maintain Berserk on stuff is really neat. Oh, what was it that I saw? I saw a really cool setup using that recently. I think I might have even featured it in the meta report. But unfortunately, because I tend to do those videos, stream of consciousness, just what comes to me at the time. I very often then forget literally everything I just said. But oh, what was it? I think it might have been on sacrifice support. That was neat to see. Though a lot of the sacrifice builds, you do not get healing from Leech. Because they use Dissolution of the Flesh. Which, effectively speaking, at least in terms of keeping your character alive, disables all forms of recovery. Ooh, Pride. Hello. Yeah, ah, uh, that's kind of a problem of doing stream of consciousness videos. Oh, hey, welcome owls. Thank you for stopping by. I hope you are doing very well. And don't worry if you are good with the YouTubes or not. But yeah, when I just talk about something a bunch, I completely forget stuff. Whereas if I script a video, because I'm thinking about it a lot more, I'll remember a lot of it. And yeah, I did see some Tainted Pact setups. They were going Tainted Pact Forbidden Right Sacrifice. Which I think is kind of an adaptation of Dan's Forbidden Right Pathfinder from Last League. Didn't look like something I'd want to play. 
but looked cool. And yes, bonking with Divine Smite, especially Smite on Crit, and the, I think it was a Parasite Power for Auto Crit. Oh man, there's so many fights that I ended just by going Crit into Crit. Well, if you ever want to know about YouTube stuff, I would be happy to teach you anything that you want. Or at least anything that I know. Because I know there's some secrets about YouTube, like, how does the algorithm work? Mm, your guess is as good as mine. Techno magic. We've got a Doriani's Institute here. Let's see. Two is bad. Three is bad. Four is good. Rip. <laughs> oh, it's fast. Goodbye, money. I say that, but I, I don't think I can complain. After hitting that chest piece, I legitimately don't think I can complain. Yeah, I really like the auto crit stuff. Ooh, half work sounds neat. I might have to try half work at some point. That's the thing about Baldur's Gate 3. It could eat up so much more of my time just because there's so many cool things that people keep telling me about that I didn't do. It probably will over time. I also think if I had gone like all in on Baldur's Gate 3, been like, yeah, I'm going to do a ton of stuff and make a ton of content for it. I don't think I would have played this PoE League at all. I think I would have gotten so absorbed in it. I would have been like, Path of Exile? What's that? I forgot. But also, well, let me tell you about how I found the Ultimate Sorcerer Warlock Hybrid class. Baldur's Gate 3 is a dangerous game in that regard. Wait, a bug? So I didn't do very much Sorlock things, but it was a draconic, yes, exactly. Playing Pee-wee casually when trying to complete all the challenges depends on what your definition of casual is. but I'm leaning towards no. I think it is far more difficult to complete all the challenges from most people's perspective of casual and PoE. Because let's just say... This, you either have to make enough currency to be able to buy this, which will take quite a while, or you have to be very good at some of the most difficult bosses in the game. Mm, two hours a day. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but that would be a very difficult task if we're talking about all challenges. Ooh. Oh, that's that's very unfortunate, Zeta. Like some of these, it's very hard to get playing two hours a day. Oops. Wait, I keep doing that. I do it wrong every time and then I do it right. So Apex, Wealth, Doriani. This is a big money one.
upgrade to Coward's Legacy. There we go. Go over and plunder the wealth of Aval. Yeah, always, always quick save. That is the rule of most games, in my opinion. And I didn't save scum to, like, do different decisions. But I did have to reload quite a bit. Oh! Enlighten 4! I believe that is what the kids call money. You know, one thing I didn't try, but I bet you could do if you're really good at it. If you kill the hag in one round. Does she even go into her lair? I would guess no. You'd need an incredibly good setup for that. Ooh, 72 rarity. Someone has to want that, right? Oh, right, right. Okay, I am going to try this. I hope I don't lose the double cup, because that would be sad. But I think I can log out and go back to my hideout here. In the instance, yes. Basically, the double cup chamber was back near the beginning, so I just wanted to do this to avoid backtracking quite as much. So I'd have to go... Duh, 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 duh. Uh, my Divine Smite crit, I did try that. I took out a good chunk of her health, but I did not take out enough, sadly. She had a lot of health. Also, I think I was slightly underleveled when I fought her. No. Oh. Okay, super tanky lightning coil. Oh, I have definitely gotten very lucky with these. Yeah, I did not do anything like that where you just respect everyone and cheese stuff. I went with nope, I'm gonna have my party relatively normal. And see what happens. I was kind of along for a ride. I'm sure four full crit paladins could do just a game-breaking level of damage, though. The funnier one in a lot of areas would be four warlocks, though. Um... I don't remember. I... I know I got a couple of really cool swords. I forget if it was a legendary or not, but I also got a very neat bow towards the end of my playthrough. But I don't remember if I got a mace or not. If I did, I probably put it on Shadowheart and then forgot about it. Because I only really paid close attention to the gearing on my Paladin and Will. Karlak kind of just did well with everything. And Shadowheart was a caster, so I didn't pay too much attention to her gear. 
But then I swap stuff up a lot on my Paladin and on Will, since he was a Blade Pact Warlock. All right, now that I've abused my streamer RNG, this definitely goes to four. Damn it. Didn't call it. Oh, well. Act what? Okay, I remember the church. There were a bunch of bandits in the church. And I... Oh, oh wait, the Gith place. Okay, not the church I was thinking of then. Yeah, no, I definitely missed it then. Oh, AoE gems damage. Okay, I'm no longer mad about not getting an Empower 4. Or Enlightened 4. Chris has appeased me. I guess this means I should buy a supporter pack, doesn't it? And uh, just to be clear, so this doesn't get taken out of context, no, you do not get better drops if you buy a supporter pack. That is just a joke I'm making. Because I think it's funny. It's not actually a thing. Yes, I went into Act 2 in the Underdark. Oh, okay. Oh, you can try Dread. I feel like YouTube's going to eat it, though. YouTube's going to be like, no linking that. I don't trust it. It's so weird that YouTube eats YouTube video links. I mean, I guess it's because what scammers would do is they'd make a video being like, how to scam someone, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I shouldn't have clicked that yet. And then link it around and get people to click on it and all that. Yeah, usually neither does YouTube. But if you are enjoying watching me do absolutely ridiculous stuff with Double Crop Gambles, do be sure to leave a like so that YouTube recommends things to, uh, or recommends other people to the stream, and the stream to other people. Also, if you're new here, welcome and uh, get subscribed so you can find your way back. Hmm, Vial of a Ritual. Don't think that's a good one. Oh, where did that file go? Oh, no. Oh, good. I already had one. It's like, I lost a vial. I want to keep track of this stuff. Personally, I would say this has gone remarkably well. Well above average in terms of number of non-bricks. Also, I, I hit the AoE duration gems. The Hall of Legends, Locus of Corruption. All right, so go right for the Locus. That's the first thing. You know what? I don't even care about the guy trying to kill me. Oof. Okay, paying the karmic tax. I mean, that's a good thing about mod support. Even if Larian doesn't, eventually someone's going to come out with a really good dual wield mod.
Hopefully Larian does. But, even if they don't... Oh, ow. Wasn't paying attention. Walked into a trap. Now, I didn't need to be here. Apex of Ascension. Uh, I would use the Cortex, personally, and do the Feared. But that's a question of what is a Divine, or I guess for probably a couple Divines. What's a couple Divines worth it to you? For me, personally, having the extra point is more worth it than having the currency. But if the Divines are, let's say going to double your total money, sell it. Because you can probably use that money for something better right now. And maybe next time you get one, or maybe later when you have more money, you can always buy one and get the benefits of the Atlas passive. But if you say, oh, you know, there's 20 divines in my stash, I'm fine. Run it. You might even get a drop that'll double your divines. All right, so Wealth of Avar first. Yeah, good luck. I wouldn't necessarily advise going for Rational Doctrine, though. While it's pretty good damage-wise and very valuable as a result, it's also quite tough to do Uber Cortex. So unless you have a lot of experience running the fight, I would not do the Uber version unless you are very okay with completely losing the Cortex. Oh, wait, I can access the Sanctum of Immortality. I just need to hold on to this. Nice. New playthrough, class and race. Hmm, white sockets. Uh, I'm going to say Halfling Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer. Because then you are a tiny dragon. You are essentially Chromie from World of Warcraft. Well, I guess Chromie would be a gnome, but either way. And now I... Yes, quite a few successes on the gamble, including a plus two AoE, plus two duration gem chess piece. What curse combo is that? Uh, I don't know. I just picked two random things off the top of my head. I mean, do you want a boring answer? Do you want to be a wood elf druid? <laughs> tiefling paladin's also kind of funny. You could go with a tiefling paladin. Malevolence Aura effect. Someone might care about that. 
Yeah, I've been surprised if a number of successes that I've hit so far. I would say I am well above the average. But sometimes 25% chance is in your favor. And sometimes, I mean, in theory, I could do all 40 chests and brick them all. I've done 36 so far. Got this. This is white sockets. This is duration and trap or mine. There are trap and mine skills with duration, so that's a plus four chest. This is trap or mine and maximum ES. Then a brick, a couple of whites. Lightning coil with socketed gems. The war cry. I don't think anyone's using corrupting cry with lightning coil. Could be wrong. Pretty sure most people are using a shako. Uh, white socket, brick. Duration gems life. Probably decent, not insane. White socket, white socket. Duration AoE. This is a big hit. That is the huge money. I think that pays for literally every single gamble here. White sockets. Damage life. Really interesting combo. Probably not top tier, but someone will buy it. AoE damage. That's probably a 20 divine chess piece. Bunch of white sockets. Reduced extra fizz while stationary. No idea if anyone wants that. Never AOE damage. That's like 40 div. And uh, yeah, we're doing the last four here. So I would say it's gone remarkably well. I would have expected way more bricks because there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bricks so far. Wait, did I count that correctly? Oh, God. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay, thirteen. Twenty bricks are the expected norm. So I am seven bricks below average with four chests left, meaning I will be at least three bricks below average, even if all three of these go badly. And statistically, two of them will, two of them won't, which will leave me five bricks below average. But remember, the statistical average is not a law. Every single chest could get double cupped. They could all get plus two gems, plus two gems. Make me an absolute fortune in the last inning, as they'd say. Or they could all just brick, poof, become complete garbage. Transcendent Mind. Hmm. Oh. oh, I was running through a wall. I was like, why can't I go that way? How many coils? 36. And the biggest hit is still the plus two duration, plus two AoE gems, which is pretty darn good. Right, and poof. Plus one brick. You know, that's true. Although, if I wasn't using item level 20 stuff, but bricking would be cool because this would be a double influenced item, and sometimes they can be genuinely awesome. But because of the way I'm doing it... Oh, wait, that helmet's garbage. Poof is actually a little bit more satisfying. I'm going to call the last three. It's going to be... Poof, poof, double corrupt. And that means I have a what? Roughly one in 60 of being correct on that.
feel like it's something like a one in 60 to call three one in four predictions in a row. But that's a really rough mental math thing that I'm probably getting wrong. Uh, it will not be max res reduced damage taken because those rolls cannot happen on these. Oh, look. Socket of gems, trap or mine. See, already wrong. Because they're item level 20, it can't roll max res and it can't roll reduced damage taken. That's why I've been getting plus gems so reliably on these double corrupts. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's pretty neat. Works really well. Oh, uh, I need to go sideways. Yes, you've been had. Apex of Ascension. Transcendent Mind. No, corrupts obey item level. Now, there are a lot of them that are very low level. But they do obey item level. Wait, really? <laughs> oh, man. The money printer's just been going burr. Wait, why am I clicking that? I don't even know why I'm clicking that. Literally picking up pennies. <laughs> So yeah, double corruption seems quite profitable at the moment. No wonder they went up to 1.5 divines. I bought the div cards. I don't know how long it would take to farm this many. I guarantee I don't have the patience for it, however long it would take. I mean, maybe when Mihoyo decides to sponsor me. Two twenty nine rarity, but I don't think rarity applies to currency. Pretty sure it's only a Puri two thing. Eight additional. That's good enough. Hmm. That's a good saying. There are some similar phrases in English. I don't know why I was just kind of clicking stuff, but good enough. It's been kind of neat to see what has and hasn't worked out with these. The only gamble stream that I did before was because I was doing stack decks. Didn't enjoy that at all. This has been much more fun. No specific reason, Devil. That was just what I ended up settling with. I think my logic was, oh yeah, the white hair looks cool. And that was it. So my reason would be because Drow have white hair. <laughs> no, no, I got interrupted. Let's try again.
That does happen. Wait, oh my God. And now you kill every monster and pick up every item. Life region. I mean, he won Path of Exile. Of course he quit after that. What else can you do? You can't keep playing after you just drop a mirror as a new player. Well, okay, I say that, but I have a really good friend that did exactly that. Dropped a mirror in, I think it was mud flats, and uh, kept playing for a really long time. Different time, though. You can't even drop a mirror in mud flats anymore. My own super rare event early on in my Pee Wee career happened completely by accident and also in mud flats. I saw a weird enemy. And I was like, wait, why is that enemy trying to run away? Well, I'm going to kill it because I don't like that it's trying to run away from me. And I killed it. And I got an albino roa feather. Which is still one of the rarest items in Path of Exile. To the point where I wouldn't be surprised if there are people in chat that don't know what an albino roa feather is. It's a meme item. It does nothing. But... It drops from an albino roa, which is incredibly rare, like Krilson levels of rare. And so, yeah, I just got it as a relatively new player. And back then, I mean, PoE was very different. There weren't even leagues yet. This was the start of the open beta. You couldn't even really make money off something like an albino roa feather. People wouldn't buy it. But it was a cool story. And it's still a cool story. So I'm glad it happened. I have no idea how many exalts or divines I've seen drop. Probably not as many as a lot of people, because I tend to spend a bunch of time doing stuff like this that doesn't drop that many exalts or divines. <laughs> I found reliquary keys. I find those pretty frequently. Hey, unique fishing rod. That's pretty good. Oh, that's a wall. I don't really want to do the Legion. I think this is the way to go now. Yes. This defense lab is, well, problematic. Oh, Chevrons. That's pretty good. That was worth a lot back in Parandus. You know, I picked that up without looking at it. Is this actually worth... Nah. Yeah, it was big back then. That and Count's Heart were the ultimate items. My super rare events, uh, Headhunter in Legion League from Kadira Perandis, Albino Roa Feather in Open Beta, Mirror of Calandra from Nemesis Four Farming in Ultimatum. It was, I think, Sentinel, where I got a Krillson. No, I forget if it was or wasn't. Sentinel for Krillson. But I got a Krillson, and in Sentinel, I also got a Mage Blood. 
So that was kind of crazy if both of those happened in the same league. Hmm. Maybe it's time to start corrupting things yourself? So the only rare event in PoE that I haven't experienced is dropping a Squire. At least I think. I don't think there's any other rare events that are possible. At least not random rare. Um, obviously, I've never been number one in lab. But that's not random. That's, well, not even a thing anymore. Huh. And I'm sure I'll drop a squire eventually. And last one. I don't think Stasis Prison's actually that rare. As weird as that sounds. Like, it's not common. But it's not that rare. It's just that not many people do Blight Ravaged maps. To, or, sorry, not Blight Ravaged. Uh, Relentless Timeless Emblems. Just like how Strangle Grasp isn't that rare, but not that many people do Blight Ravaged maps. Yeah, I mean, it might take a while. Nem4 was kind of cheating. Oh, look. Damage maximum, yes. All right. Um, I would say that this has gone exceptionally well. Better than I could have possibly hoped. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun video. Going over a bit of stuff. So I'll probably make a little uh, video talking... No, I'm not going to go drop a grandfather. I'll leave that to Mike Yabara. I don't think he's dropped one yet. Hmm. Huh. Valsword. I remember his goal was to drop a grandfather, but I don't believe he has succeeded in his goal. Oh, huh, that's a Mings. Probably not worth that much. So now I'm curious. Transcendent Mind. Let's see how much of a double corrupted chest pieces are going to roughly be worth. Oh, congratulations. So what you're saying is it's time for a spatula build instead of a ladle build. Rarity of items found. Okay. All right, so that goes here. The weakest aspect of BG3. Probably the fact that even though the game encourages you to do a lot of different things and offers you a lot of freedom to do it, eventually as you play, you will start running up against the limits of what's possible in ways that you wouldn't in an actual tabletop setting.
that it's so good at giving you choices that when you run up against the end of those choices, it's a little bit jarring. Mm, Strangle Grasp is still pretty attractive, but only because you can double corrupt it and brick it into a rare item and then roll influence mods on it or plus ones. It's the ultimate Gamba item, like even well beyond what I've been doing here. Okay, so... Now I'm going to do uh, one more thing. Uh, da, 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 da. Trade, Path of Exile, yes, show. There we go. It's time to look up the value of the chess pieces. I'll go in order, actually. I won't start with a really good one. So duration and trap or mine. So socketed trap or mine gems. No results found. Offline, 18, 20, I'm going to say this is worth about 20 because I do think there's trap and mine duration skills that people play actively. I mean, pretty sure people still play things like Exsanguinate and Seismic Trap occasionally. Ah, uh, only very occasionally in PoE do I play with other people. Most of the time, no. Then Trapper Mine plus Maximum Energy Shield. So I'm going to treat that as just Trapper Mine because I don't think anyone's buying a chess piece. All right. So by itself, Trapper Mine, not very valuable. What about if it's six linked? Because obviously it's not that hard to six link. Two div. Probably worth a price to six link. Not worth much else. Third up, Socketed Gems, Warcry Gems. For those of you keeping track, roughly 22 div, but I'm going to say 20 because it would cost a bit to six link them. I'm just going to assume it costs one div per six link. Right, so AoE plus Warcry is eight. I don't know if anyone actually wants that, though. Or, sorry, Socketed Gems plus Warcry is eight. So I'm going to say three, so plus two. Uh, so that's 22 div. It's a brick. Next one, damage. Wait, no? Duration. Yes. Duration max life. I'm sure I have people who cover all the niches on my friends list. 15. And how much is just duration without the max life? Like, 4. I'm gonna just put that at 10. So I guess 9. So 31 div, roughly in value so far. 1.5 div per. Or at least, last I checked, there were about 1.5 div per. Then there's damage in life and duration AoE. So duration AoE, this is the big money. Duration AoE, cheapest one, 56 divines. More recently, 90 divines. These have been offline for a bit. At least this one's been offline for a bit, potentially. So I'm just gonna say 60. 
So now we're looking at about 91 div. It's pretty good. And then next up is increased max life damage. I could absolutely see someone using one of those. Uh, scroll down here. Max life damage, none. All right, well, what about just damage? Six late. All right, plus two div. We're at 93 div. Chafee, the life is the uh, icing on the cake. Then we've got AoE gems damage, which I believe there's two of. Reduced extra, and we'll go from there. Uh, let's just do the two AoE gems damage, because that's got to be worth a lot. Just AoE gems. We're at 93. Just AoE, they'd be roughly 10 each. But with increased damage, well, I don't think it's worth 100. I don't think anyone would pay 90 extra divines just for 48% increased damage. But I do think it's worth a significant amount. And so I'm going to put them at 25-ish each for 50 total, bringing the total to 140 divines. I think that's a fair estimation of value on those. Reduced extra from crits, fizz while stationary. Um, I'm going to just look up. Reduced extra from crits and assume it's not worth a ton. Yeah. All right. So that one plus one div. We're at like 244 div now. And then it's socketed gems, trapper, mine and damage energy shield. Damage energy shield, I'm just gonna say two div again. So plus one, so 145. And then socketed gems and trapper mine. Oh. 30 div. So yeah, I got back around 180 divines from the double corrupted chess pieces. Assuming they all sell for the prices I just looked up, which is a dangerous assumption. But regardless of what they do sell for, I mean, I hit big, I got lucky, and this is not reflective of what you should expect going into double crups. It was fun. I made a profit. But only go into this if you are okay with losing money. Because this easily could have gone the other way. I easily could have been, you know, five double crups successfully, bunch of extra bricks and hitting nothing super amazing. If you're gonna gamble like this though, control for item level. It is generally far more profitable when you can control for item level. And if you can't on an item, it's a big, big gamble. As for how do you play a Magus, you just spell strike shock and grasp. It's all about building your character to hit stuff and uh, cast the spell. With that, thank you to everyone who tuned in. If you enjoyed, do be sure to leave a like and get subscribed so you can find your way back. But that's going to be all for me today. Special thanks to Krendor for rejoining for the 10th month, continuing his channel membership. And I'll probably put together a highlight video of sorts talking about the double corruption and how lucky I got in the very near future. Maybe even for tomorrow. We'll see. Depends on what else I'm doing. For now, thanks for watching. I'm pretty hungry, so I'm going to go eat dinner, and I'll catch you all later.